institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed to was another from that. era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good morning and welcome to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV. We're on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. And I'm with you live from 10 until 1. Coming up in the next hour, former Defence Secretary Ben Wallace says Iran must be hit back twice as hard in response to their missile attack on Israel. Both Britain and the US have urged Benjamin Netanyahu to show restraint in their response to Iran. And up to 50 Conservative MPs could vote against a controversial new government bill to eventually outlaw smoking by making it illegal for anyone born off the 1st of January 2009 to ever buy cigarettes. And later in the show, I'll bring you my exclusive interview with former Prime Minister Liz Truss. She shares her thoughts on her failed premiership, the Rwanda plan, Donald Trump, and whether Keir Starmer really believes a woman can have a penis. Do you think the other politicians, the Keir Starmers, who think that apparently 99.9% .9 of women don't have a penis, but this other 0.1%, which is thousands, I think it's about 30,000 women apparently do, um, do you think they actually believe the stuff they no, say? No, they don't. I don't believe for a minute that Keir Starmer thinks that there are any women who have a penis. <laughs> I don't know why we chose that clip, but it made me laugh. Anyway, you don't want to miss that interview coming up later in the show. First, though, let's get the latest news headlines with Emily Rose Adams. Good morning. Fears are mounting over Israel's expected retaliation to Iran's drone and missile attacks. Rishi Sunak is due to speak to the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to urge restraint after his war cabinet agreed to fight back after the weekend bombardment. Well, a former UK ambassador to Iran's told Talk TV it's hugely concerning. I don't see myself how it's possible to attack Iran on its homeland without generating a massive Iranian response, which would endanger the whole region, the world economy, uh, certainly some Britons in the region and our forces, and certainly American targets. So the decision that the War Cabinet appears to have taken is an extremely dangerous one. The Rwanda safety bills heading back to the House of Lords for further scrutiny after MPs rejected amendments they'd made to the legislation. The bill seeks to compel judges to regard Rwanda as safe in a bid to clear the way to send asylum seekers who cross the channel in small boats on a one-way flight to the country. Well, some ministers insist that we will see flights take off for the African nation within weeks. Donald Trump's criminal trial has started with more than half of the potential jurors ruled out within minutes. 60 of the 96 said they were unable to be impartial in the first criminal trial in history to involve a current or former president. Well, Trump is accused of falsifying business records to hide hush money payments to the porn star Stormy Daniels before the 2016 election, allegations that he denies. Well, the chair of Republicans Overseas UK, Greg Swenson, has told us New Yorkers have strong feelings about Trump. It's going to be really difficult to find an impartial jury in New York. It's a very hostile jury pool, hostile to Trump. Right. You know, 88 percent of the jury pool is Democrat and, and not just Democrat voted for Biden, but really hostile to Trump. If this trial was in Staten Island, Trump would be acquitted tomorrow morning, you know, they, where they really like him. Police in Australia have declared the stabbing of a priest at a Sydney church yesterday as a terrorist act. Four people, including the bishop, suffered non-life-threatening issues. A 16-year-old boy, who's also hurt, has been arrested. We believe there are elements that are satisfied in terms of religious uh, motivated extremism and, of course, the intimidation of the public through that person's acts by attending that church whilst it was being live-streamed. Meanwhile, an outpouring of grief continues in Sydney over the separate stabbings which saw six people, including a mother, killed in a frenzied knife attack in a shopping mall. 
The woman who loaded a gun for actor Alec Baldwin on a film set which killed the cinematographer Helena Hutchins has been jailed. The judge ruled the actions of Hannah Gutierrez Reed, who was the weapons handler for the film Rust, constituted a serious violent offence, saying if it weren't for you, Miss Hutchins, a wife and mother, would still be alive. And MPs will debate legislation today designed to give the UK some of the strictest smoking laws in the world. Rishi Sunak wants to make Generation Alpha, born since 2009, the UK's first smoke-free generation, with anyone turning 15 from this year banned from buying cigarettes. But many Conservative MPs are expected to rebel against the plans. You're up to date with the headlines. Now time for a look at today's weather with Nazneen Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello. So it's not looking as windy as it was yesterday, but it's still looking pretty blustery for this afternoon and a northerly wind direction means it's feeling cool despite the sunshine. There will be some showers around in between the sunny spells as well. Some of them could be heavy and thundery with the risk of hail, particularly around parts of the Midlands and eastern and southeastern parts of England. And temperatures around average for the time of year, highs of 12 to 13 degrees Celsius. Now overnight, a lot of the inland showers will fade away. It stays blustery through the night, so we won't see a widespread frost, but I think we will see frosts in rural spots, particularly around parts of Scotland, and showers will continue around the northeast of Scotland, as well as some coastal areas of the east and west. But otherwise, tomorrow we'll do it all again, another day of sunshine and showers across many areas, and there will also be cloudier skies with spells of showery rain spreading across Ireland and Northern Ireland through the day, later towards western parts of Scotland. A few of the showers turning wintry across the high ground of the northeast of Scotland. Otherwise, elsewhere they are going to be rain showers, perhaps not as heavy nor as thundery as the last couple of days. Then as we head into the weekend, high pressure builds and it looks more settled, calmer and drier. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good morning and welcome back to the show. I'm Julia hartley Brewer, and you are with Talk TV. Joining me right now to run through all the biggest stories of the day is editor of Spiked Online, Tom Slater. Good morning, Good morning. once again to you. Um, there's no doubt at all, um, front page is still very much dominated by uh, Iran and Israel. Um, and an interesting intervention actually from Ben Wallace, the former Defence Secretary, um, who actually was speaking out quite a lot even when he was a Defence mm. Secretary. Uh, he's saying Iran is acting like a bully and he says must be hit back twice as hard as Israel was hit uh, by uh, by Iran uh, he said that Israel prepares you know is this, is Israel prepares to retaliate after that missile attack now we've had Rishi Sunak who's got a, a call in with Ben Netanyahu today we know Joe Biden has uh, urged um, along with other Western powers you know restraint on Israel uh, but it's interesting that we have spoken yesterday to uh, uh, Colonel Richard Kemp a former commander of uh, uh, British forces in Afghanistan and, and he was making exactly the same point as Ben Wallace that in this region you know they only understand power, they only understand strength, and any failure to retaliate in a strong way will be seen as weakness and will encourage further uh, attacks. And also the point that, you know, if Iran was saying, we, we, don't, we don't want to continue this, if they didn't want to continue this, they could have done a sort of a, a small military target tit for tat in return for the Revolutionary Guard generals and military officers being killed in their uh, mm -hmm. compound in Damascus. Um, they went for a mass attack on civilians. They upgraded it deliberately. Is it tenable for Israel not to respond? And what do you think an appropriate response from Israel would be? I don't think anyone doubts that Israel is going to respond and has a right to respond in some way, shape or form. Obviously, you're seeing the attempt from Western leaders who are getting increasingly nervous about their support for Israel, telling them to, to rein it in. Um, there's a lot of discussion about whether or not this is going to be a kind of like for like. Um, that seems something which could potentially really kind of cause a breach between Israel and its Western backers, um, or whether or not this is a case of mounting some sort of assault on the proxies who are continuing to fire at Israel, yes. whether that's Hezbollah, the Houthis, or whatever. So it's um, it's an incredibly difficult situation. And actually, I'm sure there, there are there are people on both sides of this conflict who will not want it to escalate. Yeah. They want to respond. But they also yeah. will not want it to escalate because a lot of them have got enough on their hands, yeah. <laughs> to be perfectly frank. So I think but Israel doesn't want a war with Iran, and I don't mm. think Iran wants a war with Israel. No. They just wanted to do a big show of strength. 
Exactly. They, ha they had to retaliate. And Israel will have known mm -hmm. after that attack on the on the, the consulate compound, it wasn't actually on the consulate, it was on the compound um, where, you know, it was Revolutionary Guard officers are based uh, in Damascus and Syria. They knew there would be response. The same way that Hamas knew that yeah. Israel would respond to their October the 7th massacre. OK, so, but it's a question of what that like response was. And the attack from Iran over the weekend was unprecedented in its scale mm -hmm. of ferocity. It is a simple matter of luck that we did not see more than one child severely mm -hmm. injured um, because of the Iron Dome. But, but... Nevertheless, 301 missiles and, and drone attacks you know, rain down on, mm -hmm. on Israel. No, absolutely. And obviously, it's... it's we, 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 we wouldn't put up with that. No, you wouldn't. I mean, this is the thing. <laughs> Even though it was probably partly calculations that they anticipated much yeah. of this to be intercepted, that doesn't change the fact that if you fire 300-plus explosives, whether that's yeah. ballistic missiles, whether that's um, the drones, whether that's cruise missiles at a country, that that is an incredible... And that's a civilian target. Absolutely. It's, an, it's a remarkable provocation, which is going to elicit some sort of response. The question is what, and I think, um, obviously, it, the idea that Israel has no right to respond in this instance is, is crazy to me, that people will be talking over the weekend as if Israel started this with that strike on that consulate, as if Iran has had nothing to do with Hamas and nothing to yeah. do with Hezbollah and nothing to do with the Houthis, these, these proxies which they continue to fund an arm and with the stated policy of wanting to destroy what they refer to as the Zionist entity. Yeah. So the idea that Israel just woke up one morning and thought, you know what, we're going to bomb yeah. some, Israel, uh, some Iranian generals in Syria and start a new front in this war is absolutely for the birds. But as ever, there's always going to be calculations that are made because of the fact that, as you say, on both sides of Israel and Iran, there are people who yeah. want to make their presence felt but also don't want this conflict to broaden when they've got enough to be dealing with. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're going to be talking about that a little bit later with a Conservative MP and indeed and actually a, a former military officer as well. Um, I want to talk also about what's going on in the House of Commons today. We have a vote on the proposed smoking ban. This is the idea that anyone born after, well, on, on or after the 1st of January 2009, mm. so if, if you're under 15 now, you're never going to be allowed to legally buy cigarettes. But it does mean that, and this is following a, a law in New Zealand, which, by the way, has already been dropped by a change, uh, a, a new government, um, uh, that, uh, but the idea about this is, look, you know, most people don't smoke. Most people are opposed to smoking. Most smokers want to give up smoking. And things like the indoor smoking ban in uh, 2007, I think it came in, um, actually remarkably popular. People say, oh, this won't work. This will be, this will be a terrible idea. Actually, people are probably happy with it. I know it's not been good for some pubs, but you know what, as someone who's an ex-barmaid in a pub, it would have loved to have worked in a pub that didn't have smoking. Um, but um, largely that has been accepted and welcomed by pretty much everybody. This is clearly the next stage. This is about basically long term bringing in a ban on smoking full stop. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, in 20, 30 years, there'll be you know, pretty much no one who's still smoking. Um, I used to be quite nanny state. I used to, I, I don't, I'm really, really anti-smoking. Mm -hmm. I was thrilled with the indoor smoking ban. I worked in offices where people smoked cigarettes, you know, next to me, left and right in front of me, you know, at six in the morning. It was absolutely foul. So I, I, I was thrilled with that. However, that has an impact on me. Other people, someone wants to smoke in their own home or buy cigarettes or smoke outside. I don't see what that impact is on me or anyone else. Do you support this ban or not? Absolutely not. No, I think it's crazy. Do you smoke? I think it's a liberal. I do a bit, mm -hmm. not as much as I used to. Um, but it's not for that reason, because obviously under this ban, I'll be fine for the rest of my days. Yep. Um, but it's... Um, he's baby-faced, but he's not I'm under not, 15. I'm not under <laughs> 15 years old, contrary to popular belief on Twitter. Um, but no, it's one of those things where it's a question of principle. I don't think the state has a right to tell you what you should be able to consume in your well, own life. Well, one second. Well, wait a minute. As put, we we have a ban body. on heroin and being sold legally. And... Well, I think the war on drugs has been a catastrophic mistake. I think extending it to tobacco is a terrible idea um, because of all of the things that we know that comes with it, a, a thriving black market. Market, um, the fact that you can't regulate this particular industry as much as you might want to make products safe. Um, and also, if the stated aim here is to stop people from smoking, first of all, smoking rates have been tumbling anyway. Yeah. Um, this is something that was really kind of sorting itself out. Young people, yes, some of them are vaping now, but that, that's not proven to be a gateway to smoking. That's a complete It's an alternative myth. to smoking. Absolutely. And then that's the other thing this bill does, which is it's starting to introduce measures around vaping, which is crazy because... Essentially, the number one way many people have been able to get off cigarettes is via yeah. vaping, which, at a conservative estimate, is about 95% safer. So yeah, all it may not be safe, together, but loads of things we do want safe, it, but safer is definitely a good thing. Absolutely. But I think it just comes down to a question of principle. Should the state be able to dictate what adults 
mm. of age should be able to do in their own And this is life. it, because people talk about children else. smoking, and most people start smoking before the age of 18. Mm. Yes, but yes, but it's illegal for children to buy cigarettes, but yes, somehow everyone still managed to get a hold of them. But we're going to see, in just a very few years' time, the absurdity of someone who is 18 years old, an adult, being able yeah. to buy cigarettes, and someone who is a day younger, <laughs> also 18, unable to buy, mm -hmm. um, uh, buy cigarettes. And then we're going to see people, you know, 50 and 51 in years to come. I mean, now, Challenge most... 57 yes. badges on people yes, working exactly. shops. Now, I'm, I'm thinking, realistically, at that point, this is when people will say, you know, when this, when this bill actually comes into law, within a few months, people go, this is absurd, this is nonsense. Yeah. An adult not being able to buy something when they, you know, their mate next to them can, mm. uh, because they were born a few hours earlier. I mean, it's, it, it's crazy. And at that point, will the solution be, oh, this law doesn't work, get rid of it? Or will the solution be, well, we should bring in a ban for everybody mm -hmm. then? Because the slippery slope we have seen from the public health advocates, let's go advocates, but I mean, they are absolute fascists. They really, I mean, they really do want to control people's lives. There will be a ban on that. Now, I got, you know, 10 years ago, five years ago even, I would have been like, yeah, you know what? That's a good thing. These are cancer sticks. That's great. But now I know that their aim is to come for everything that is fun in life including, you know, people having a drink. Uh, I mean, not, not, not getting drunk, having a drink. Um, you know, adverts for butter on yep. the London Underground system. You know, having sugar, having a cake with sugar in. Yeah, shocker. I mean, these people want to control everything. Uh, they will not be happy until we are living on muesli. Absolutely. And that's been the case time and time again. You saw this morning, Chris Whitty, the, who's still the Chief Medical Officer for some reason, were, one, yes. you know, wandering yeah. around the um, broadcast studios. And the only line of questioning was, so we're also going to clamp down on vapes now. What about fast food advertising? Yeah, what about this? What about that? And I'm sorry, but, you know, also health and longevity is not the only aim in life. Some people actually want to enjoy themselves. Yes. Some people enjoy a bit of pleasure. Some people will make that trade-off. So yes. on how, the how many grounds, extra years am I going to spend in a care home with dementia as opposed to... How many extra nights out am I going to have having a good time at the pub with my mates? And, you know, you, you should, I don't think anyone would want to look to someone like Chris Whitty as the no. way to live a good life. I mean, it's, you know, you might be perfectly healthy, but you might not have a particularly fun time of it. So I think it's just a reminder that these decisions are best taken by individuals. Obviously, we don't allow yeah. children to smoke or to vape at the moment. Yeah. That's completely yeah. fine. And by the way, the people Beyond asking that, those questions today or the, in the media, we go Radio 4 and everywhere, these are the people who were cheering on the lockdowns Absolutely, quite happily. Yeah. Oh, by the way, if you're worried about excess deaths, yeah, take a look in the mirror, both Chris Whitty and indeed all the journalists who failed to ask any of the proper questions. So, so we're not taking lessons from you uh, and lectures from you on any of this stuff. Uh, but I do want to hear from you, my lovely audience, who are much more sensible than these people, about the smoking ban, because we're asking about MPs who are going to vote today. There'll be 50 Tory MPs probably who will rebel. It's on a free vote, it's not a three-line whip. I mean, but... You know, it's going to go through with Labour support because they are whipping. But it's going to ban anyone born since 2009 from ever being able to legally buy cigarettes. Do you want support the ban? Do you oppose the ban? Crucially, tell us why you do, tell us why you don't. Give us a call on 0344 499 1000, text on 87222, or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Calls are charged at the national rate. Text costs one standard network rate message. I'd love to hear from you. Um, right, let's also talk about Liz Truss. Um, she is in the news. She's got a brand new book uh, that's just been published, uh, 10 Years to Save the West. Um, spoke to her on, on the show uh, actually um, yesterday uh, at a pre record. We're going to be playing that out a little bit later on the show. And um, it was very interesting, actually, talking to her. Uh, um, and I do want to play um, um, a, 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 few, a few clips uh, ahead of when we actually uh, run, run the interview. Um, first of all, uh, about you know, where we are with, you know, with Ukraine, with, with uh, Israel, Iran, Gaza, uh, with Russia, everything. And I asked her a really, really straightforward question. Um, you know, are we safer with Trump or Biden as president? And here's what she had to say. Will the world be a safer place uh, after November the 5th this year with President Trump uh, in the, back in the Oval Office or President Biden remaining there? It will be safer with President Trump. Why? And I hope he gets elected. Um, there's plenty more clips to come on that, but um, it's quite interesting. There's no doubt at all, you know, Trump is um, someone who Liz Truss would certainly prefer. Um, but we talked about, I mean, numerous things. Mm. Net Zero, um, Rwanda Bill, Keir Starmer and women with penises. It had to come up. <laughs> trans -hydrate. She's actually, to, cre to her credit, she's actually someone who did uh, try and, you know, mm. uh, push back against the, the, the trans ideology madness in government when she was in government. Um, but... Um, 
I thought one of the interesting questions with I asked her actually was her interesting answer from her was, does she regret, you know, what she did? Does she regret becoming prime minister? She could have been, in some people's minds, the greatest prime minister we never had. Like, well, if only we'd had Liz Truss to sort things out. As it was, it was a disaster, mm -hmm. her premiership. Um, and she says she doesn't regret it. Do you think the country still does, Tom? Well, I think it's quite clear from the polling evidence that no one is nostalgic for that very brief <laughs> Liz Truss um, tenure. I think uh, Liz Truss, there's like a couple of things can be true at the same time about it. One of which is that some of the prognosis about what had gone wrong with the country, I think was correct yeah. in relation to some of the ridiculous policies we've been wedded to in relation to net zero. If the lack of any plan for growth, also the fact that there is such a thing as the sort of orthodoxy, whether that's in the yeah. Treasury, whether that's in the OBR, whether that's in the International Monetary Fund, which has clearly failed. And yeah. I think economically and proven, all of that's I mean, been proven again and again, reason. and yet still held to. Absolutely. Um, and there is a big problem with sections of the state ha being in, having far too much power to dictate policy and so on. Um, and there was a big part of the way in which those various institutions, those international institutions, as well as our own domestic setup, did try to kind of agitate to, to get rid of her, or at least made it a lot harder for her. That being said, it's a reminder that I don't think her solutions were necessarily the right ones, but also, to be frank, she wasn't the right person to bust through this particular consensus. So I think her premiership is a reminder that we do have all of these problems, but yeah. we're also lacking the kind of leadership to yeah. actually... But also, I mean, she talked a lot in the interview, actually, about, you know, the the you know the civil service, the, you know, this kind of blob around mm. you, which kind of prevents you from doing anything. Um, uh, which, which is interesting. But again, she's something of a bull in a china shop, which what I rather like about her, having, sharing quite a lot of the same t t character traits, but perhaps you do need to be someone who's a bit more of a people person to be able to push this stuff through. But again, I also have this view, you know, okay, she, you know, she, you know democratically elected government in, in Boris Johnson, he was ousted by his MPs. The, the Prime Minister is the leader of the largest party. She had a majority. I think it was still about 60 plus then. You know, obviously it had gone down from the 80 with various MPs uh, losing their jobs and things over the over the, the couple of years. But um, but you know, she was she was you know as democratically elected with as much of a of a mandate as anybody to be in that job, having been chosen by the the Tory members. Um, and yet she couldn't get anything done without without you know these sort of the civil service, the yeah. treasury, the you know um, the office of budget responsibility, the Bank of England trying to stop her, and that we do have a real issue with unaccountable, unelected people and organisations in this country that prevent the the the, the will of the people mm -hmm. being enacted. I completely agree. I think the question is, what do you then do about that? Because yeah. it'd be very easy for Liz Truss or Boris Johnson or any of these other people to just wail about the status quo and how difficult it is for elected politicians to get policy through. But I think there has been a thing since 2016 where the certain Tory leaders have decided they're going to pick a fight with the establishment, with the technocrats, whatever, and then being shocked that it's actually quite difficult yeah. to have that fight. So it just shows that we need, as I say, better leadership, a, a sense of more of a kind of consistency, a strong intellectual case that they're going to make to the country, to yeah. the world at large to roll the pitch for actually yeah. quite um, controversial reforms yeah, and so they don't come out of nowhere. Preparing the that ground, kind of exactly. And there's, I think there's a lot of preparing of the ground going on with Labour and the Tories on NHS reform. Mm. That is certainly, that has been an absolute sea change in terms of attitude of many in power on that beginning. You just simply can't afford to just keep ploughing money into, a, into an organisation mm. that is, is not improving in that sense. Um, let's also talk about um, what's going on stateside. We had Donald Trump appearing at his first ever criminal trial of a former US president. Um, he's not happy about it, I think we can safely say. Uh, this, of course, is the Stormy Daniels hush money trial. Now, of course, he's not on trial for paying a bunch of money to a former porn actress who claims she had an affair with him. He's always denied this, of course. Um, he's actually on, uh, on, on trial for, you know, basically, you know, doctoring his accounts, his, his books, uh, to, to basically hide the payment of that money, which he gave, his claim to uh, Cohen, his... Uh, uh, his his uh, legal aid and and advisor and was then paid on to Stormy Daniels. Of course, the chief witness against him is going to actually be uh, Cohen. Um, but he uh, he's been required to appear in court every day um, for four days a week, claiming that he's not going to be able to go on campaign trail, um, not being able to perhaps attend even his youngest son Barron's uh, high school graduation. I mean, the court is making him into a victim here, he's going to, a martyr, he's going to love it. But let's have a little watch of a clip uh, and a listen to a clip of what he had to say uh, as he arrived at court yesterday. This is political persecution. This is a persecution like never before. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. 
And again, it's a case that should have never been brought. It's an assault on America. And that's why I'm very proud to be here. This is an assault on our country. You've got to love the chutzpah, the mm. claim. Now, you know, whether or not people think this is a legitimate trial to bring or whether this is politically motivated or, you know, reasonable, but an assault on America, nobody has ever seen like this, uh, this uh, you know, no one has ever been persecuted like Donald Trump. I mean, really? Well, the, they've handed him this, though, haven't they? Yep. Because when all of these various legal cases kicked off, Trump was really not doing particularly well in the kind of primary race. Um, it was, there was He was constant always talking. way ahead. He, well, he, there was, that was the point in which, you know, there was conversations about DeSantis nipping ahead. Even in some polls, yeah. that seemed to be a possibility. He was increasingly seen as a bit of a dead weight. This was before he'd re the campaign had kicked off proper. So once he yeah. properly declares as a large part of the base that can get behind him. But it wasn't looking rosy for him, let's say that. Since all of this has kicked off, not only hit, did he soar completely ahead of any of his Republican challengers, just left them totally in the dust, but also in the general election polling, you see him maintaining leads over Biden, starting to close yep. a little bit as one would have expected. But this is the guy who was supposedly so unelectable that, it was, they, that the Democrats wanted him to be yep. the candidate. Also, all of these trials, you know, you don't have to be some sort of conspiracy theorist to realise that there is a desire to get him by any means necessary. Alvin Bragg, the DA in Manhattan, who brought this case, it was a very shoddy legal case, I'm reliably informed, um, was basically elected on the Get Trump ticket. Yep. And the aim was that we'll use this to either keep him out of the campaign trial or to just discredit him. And it's failed because it's burnished his narrative of they're out he to get He makes more money, he goes up in the polls. Although if he does actually get convicted again, it's unlikely he'll go to jail. Um, but again, it's, there's an argument where well, just because you're a former president and you're running again, it doesn't mean you shouldn't be uh, tried on this. I mean, there are always different mm -hmm. cases, but this is the criminal one. But again, it does impact on the ability to run for president. But then, you know, don't pay hush money to... Uh, to, to Paul Stars and I mean, could you? Here's a, could you? They, they've got rid of. I mean, half the witnesses, straight, I mean, half witnesses, yeah. half the jurors yeah. were asked question. You know, you know, do you think you could be, you know, neutral and unbiased? And they all went, no, I can't. Um, whether they just wanted to get out of the trial, um, yeah. uh, maybe it's the same as here. Where, you know, you don't get paid. I'm assuming you don't get paid and you get a, a you know, your, your basic expenses. And last thing people who've got a paid job to want to do. But do you think you could be unbiased at a trial for Donald Trump? Well, I would hope so. Um... I'm also one of those people in a rare position where I'm not a fan of Donald Trump, but I also think the people who are opposed to him are even more dreadful in so many respects. Yeah, I'm sure that's the thing. I'm Just kind of with you on that. I, I could absolutely judge, yes. Yeah, and I'm anti-anti-Trump, I've been for a long time. But it is one of those things where I think this is a reminder of just how politicised this has become. Yeah. And yes, we could talk about no president should be above the law. Of course that's the case. But at the same time, this indictment, I mean, it was a load of... The way that they've kind of dressed this up is almost yeah. like it's a campaign finance violation. Yeah. It just shows the kind of... Legal acrobatics. On the technicality, that that, I think that's what it's, but, but again, they didn't bring this back in 2021 yeah. when he was out of and office. And also, this started with Donald Trump's a fascist, he's in the pocket of the Russians, he's yeah. done this, he's done that. Now it's like was, he yeah, was engaging was. in some creative accounting to pay off his mistress. So it's kind of been... Yeah. Shows you just Alleged how desperate Alleged mistress. It is. I don't think they're worried about this. But anyway, I just want to bring in one other story. Uh, deep fake images are to be outlawed. I have to say, it is quite shocking, the ability people have now to... Uh, um, uh, you know, well, there'll be deep fake images which are, you know, deliberately aimed at, you know, at hurting people. But we see this with politicians. I mean, again, you see a clip online, you're thinking, mm -hmm. is that actually the person saying it or is it not? We've seen a few. They go around quickly. Um, and again, these people deliberately trying to mislead, as most people might make a mistake every now and then. Um, but uh, but also deep fake images used to, you know, as revenge porn. Yeah. Um, really, really nasty stuff. But you know, we, this this there's no doubt at all. We, this is the world we are going to be living in in the future. Absolutely, and it'd be questions about how much we can kind of keep pace with this sort yeah. of thing because it's been striking how in recent years even pretty crude versions of these deep fakes have gotten around, even amongst people who should know better in some cases, you know, quite quite mainstream accounts and whatnot. So um, it's a reminder, I think, that everyone just needs to be that bit more sceptical of how they engage with online, but yeah. also, as you say, this has a much more sinister aspect to it, which is not just embarrassing a politician or making it sound like they said yeah. something they this didn't. Is a, this is about you know, thwarting democratic, you know, democratic mm -hmm. elections, isn't it? Well, look, there's so much more to talk about. Tom Sate is here for the whole show. Uh, today, though, we are asking you about MPs uh, who will vote today to ban anyone born since 2009 from ever being able to buy cigarettes legally. Do you support or 
oppose that ban. Tell us why you do, tell us why you don't. Give us a call on 0344 499 1000, text on 8722, or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Darren has done just that and says it's up to an individual to make that choice. The government is becoming too controlling. Sam says, I'm a pretty old fashioned liberal. The government has the right to inform the people about the dangers, but people should be free to make their own choice. And Callum says, if this, is, if this ban comes into force, then how is the government going to plug the hole in the finances that will be made due to lost tax revenue? Very good point. You've also been getting in touch on the phones. Do please keep those calls coming in on 0344 499 1000. Let's go to Roy, who is in Aberdeen. Hello, Roy. Hello, good morning, Julia. Good morning. What do you want to say? Do you support the ban or not? Uh, no, I certainly do not support the ban. Uh, not because I'm a smoker, because I'm not. But uh, it's an old thing in politics, like, it's never about what they say it's about. This is about bringing ID cards for everyone. Because this oh, bill yeah. has no way of being enforced without the ability of a shopkeeper to demand to show your ID. Yeah. And that is what this is about. Yeah, and that's very different, isn't it, from, say, you know, you might be asked for ID if you look like you might be under 25, if you're buying alcohol and, you know, uh, and, and, you know, that's, you know, just because lots of people look quite different ages. But this could, you know, you could be asked for ID if you're 57. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's just a smoke screen for uh, in demanding authoritarian power over us is what it's about. I mean, Tony if Blair never... I mean, I know Tony Blair's not in power anymore, but he's always out campaigning. He's desperate to us all to have ID cards, isn't he? Yes, and that's what, that, that's, that is exactly what it's about. Why are you so worried about having, having to produce an ID card? I mean, presumably you've got I loads of ID in your wallet. There's the things well, I'm opposed to ID cards, and yeah, I've got my driving licence with me. I show a passport at the border. I've got numerous bits of documentation which prove who I am. Why, why does yeah. it bother you? Well, not everyone has to show a passport at the border, does it? Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, the government have a total authoritarian control. The same as the, the, the digital money thing, like, this is all about the government knowing what you do, when you do, how you do it, and what you do it on, and whether they give you permission for us or not. Yeah. Now, that is an extreme authoritarian kind of government, which is not what you call a democracy. In a, in a true democracy... The government is scared of the people, not the other way around. Here, here to that. As well Roy. They learned or remembered that it's them who actually work for us. Here, here. I love it. Roy, thank you so much. Great call. Thank you. Do call in against Roy and Aberdeen. Coming up after the break, after the former Defence Secretary Ben Wallace says Iran must be hit back twice as hard in response to their missile attack on Israel, we'll be talking to Tory MP James Sunderland. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer, and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey, Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans 
sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, it put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 what did fail her. Yeah, it was, it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV. Now, the former Defence Secretary Ben Wallace has said that Iran must be hit back twice as hard in response uh, to their missile attack on Israel. Now, both Britain and the US have urged Benjamin Netanyahu to show restraint in his response uh, to that Iran attack. Joining me now to discuss this is Conservative MP and former Army officer James Sunderland. Good morning to you, James. Morning, Julia. How are you? Very well indeed. Thank you very much. You just be a bit worried about World War III, but I'm wondering whether a strong response from Israel to Iran, which is clearly a threat to peace in the Middle East, um, uh, in terms of their proxy terror organisations around the whole of the Middle East, indeed around Europe as well, um, whether that is how we best avoid World War III, or whether no response or a very restrained response is how we best avoid World War III. What do you think? Well, since the events of 7th of October last year, um, we are on the brink now of conflict in the Middle East. I believe that politicians have a responsibility to dial down the rhetoric and to make sure that we de-escalate wherever possible. Um, Israel has every right to defend itself, but it's a question of timing, whether it chooses to do it now or later or not at all. Um, Israel, in my view right now, has enough on its plate dealing with uh, Gaza and Hamas. Um, and I think that uh, any escalation right now would not be the right thing to do. But hold on a minute, they've got off on their plate dealing with Hamas, you know, and indeed Hezbollah, filing rockets in from Lebanon, all of whom are funded... Oh, let me check my notes. Oh, Iran. Um, I mean, this is the reason why, you know, Iran were ret was retaliating for an attack on, on a, a compound in D Damascus uh, where you know, Revolutionary Guard generals and military chiefs were, were, were killed. But that was because they have been targeting Israel through their proxies. I mean... You know, you know that, I know that, everyone knows that. So the idea that the idea that Israel doesn't respond to a huge escalation by Iran, it is a simple matter of luck. And thanks to the aid of, you know, the Iron Dome, US, UK, uh, French and indeed Jordanian uh, you know, military jets shooting down some of these missiles, it's a miracle that we didn't see mass civilian casualties in Israel as a result of this attack. Would anyone be asking Israel to sort of, you know, cooler heads, cut, tone down the rhetoric, if that were the case? Of course they wouldn't. Israel's got every right to defend itself. We saw that uh, with Hamas. Um, if you look at what the Iranians are doing in the Middle East right now, deliberate destabilisation, have a look at the Houthi, have a look at Hezbollah, have a look at Hamas. There is no question at all that the Iranians are deliberately destabilising the region uh, and trying to preempt conflict. But whether or not Israel retaliates, whether or not Israel attacks Iran, is absolutely a matter for Israel. And I believe that the US government and the British government are quite right in saying publicly that they would not join that. We need to de-escalate tension right now. We need to contain the crisis, not exacerbate it. Nobody wants World War III. No, no, well, indeed. Well, I mean, I don't know, apart from the Iranians, you seem to be quite keen on it. was just... Um, can I ask you about also Rishi Sunak rejecting calls coming from Labour and senior Conservatives as well uh, to uh, prescribe Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps? Uh, the concerns, of course, that, you know, that they are the ones propagating a lot of this, these terror cells and funding them. But the answer from the government has been, look, basically, you know, that is, you know, that is... Is he, that is Tehran's, you know, diplomatic core as well. We need to maintain relations with uh, Iran so that we can actually, you know, have those back channels and the like and maintain an embassy in Tehran as well. 
Who do you agree with? Should we prescribe this organisation, which is clearly funding terror, or should we not? Well, responsible Western governments need to keep their powder dry, in my view. And uh, if you look yesterday in the chamber at uh, the Prime Minister's statement, it's quite clear to me that there are an increasing number of people now demanding that the British government does prescribe the IGC. And, of course, many Labour politicians in that as well. Um, that is definitely an option that sits with the Prime Minister and the British government. But at this point in time, noting that we do need to maintain diplomatic relations with Tehran, um, you know, they, they are clearly the pariah of the Middle East at the moment. But, uh, but, but if we cut off ties with them by prescribing the IRGC, that will only serve to undermine future attempts at negotiation and peace. OK, can I uh, bring us back to domestic politics? Uh, MPs voted to defeat Lords' amendments on the Rwanda bill last night. It's going to go back to the Lords, then come back to the Commons. Ping-pong will be over. And it's said, you know, by Friday, pretty confident the government is now that we're going to see that Rwanda, well, safety of Rwanda bill become law. Prime Minister said he wanted to get flights off the ground by end of spring. You know, we're, we're approaching that pretty soon. We're going to have legal challenges. You know that, I know that. Do you think that we are going to see any of those flights to Rwanda taking off with any actual channel migrants on board? Well, let's be clear. The Rwanda bill will become law. Um, the government has the numbers to ensure that it does become law. Uh, we are resisting further attempts by the Lords to amend the bill any further. This thing will go through and it must go through. And in terms of the flights themselves, well, quite clearly, once the statute's in place, once the law is in place, we can then work on operationalising the plan to get the flights off, which must happen. And again, this is not just about the Rwanda plan per se. That's just part of a much wider lexicon of measures that the British government's taking. This is about effective deterrence so that further um, asylum seekers, refugees and mainly economic migrants uh, don't seek that perilous journey across the channel. We've got to stop illegal migration, and that's what the British government intends to do. Um, can I also ask you about the vote tonight in the House of Commons? Uh, there's a free vote, so it's an unwhipped vote on the, the uh, bringing in a smoking ban for anyone who's sort of 15 now, never being able to legally buy uh, cigarettes, following on from a, a law in New Zealand, although that law has already been dropped by the incoming uh, New Zealand government. Um, how are you going to vote tonight? Julia, another great question. Um, it's not I a think great question. It's, it's a perfectly it normal journalist question. question. Stop delaying. How are you voting tonight? OK, I'm a low-tax, low-state, low-regulation Conservative. Regulation sits uneasily with me. We over-regulate with everything we do. People want government out of their lives, not in their lives. I'm very keen to support the Prime Minister, but I may exercise my right to abstain. Abst Wait a minute. So you think this is a terrible law, but you're not going to vote against it? It's not whipped. It's a free conscience vote, like, you know, votes on moral issues, abortion, assisted dying and the like. You can... You, why don't you just vote against? Julia, you're going to get me all sorts of trouble here. I think no, the bottom line is... It's a free vote. Is, You're not going to be breaking MPs, the whip. Um, MPs vote mainly because they have to and because they want to. Where there is a free vote, we've got the ability to support the, the legislation, to vote against it or to abstain. Yeah. Uh, as I said earlier, I am a free, um, a free market, low tax, low regulation conservative. Yeah. I probably will support the Prime Minister, but the bottom line is that I'm not in favour of further regulation. We so need to that, get government so you're out so, of you're so in favour of individual freedom and so in favour of getting government out of people's lives on an opportunity to vote down a measure that would do that and impinge on people's freedom and their personal lives, you're just going to not vote and sit on the fence. I mean, sorry, have you changed into Keir Starmer since the start of this interview? No, not at all. I mean, I'm not going to vote against it because I think ultimately we've got to stop smoking. Smoking is bad well, well, for all sorts of reasons. Smoking's going down Talking already. In it, yes. but, smoking, but, but smoking. When you token, were young and when I was young, far more people smoke. Far more people now have given up or they've taken up vaping, which is not good, but it's darn sight safer than smoking. Why do we need to introduce this ban? And I say this, by the way, as well, an avid anti-smoker. I hate being around people smoking. Well, I think that people do have freedoms, and I think that uh, we don't want people to be told what to do every day of their lives. you're going so to allow I'm that. very sympathetic to this measure. I'm very sympathetic for the need to stop smoking. But, but the point is, it's about how you enforce it. It's about how you regulate it. Your previous caller talked about ID cards. How do shopkeepers enforce the law? So, in my view, I'm very supportive of the Prime Minister. He's absolutely moving in the right direction, but I think there's more detail to come here. And for that reason, I will either support the measure or abstain against it.
Oh, now we're going to possibly support... I mean, James, I mean, give... I was so hopeful from the start of your answer on that, that first time round, but it's gone... Uh, we talk about how these sort of measures become slippery slopes. That answer was a slippery slope. But no, I, 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 I would admit, like to support it I because of the need to support the Prime Minister. I appreciate your honesty about sitting on the fence abstain, and not standing up for your principles. Work to do. <laughs> James, thank you for joining Take care. us. Take care. I will do. I don't think he did think it was a great question. <laughs> Still with me, it's Tom Slater. Um... I've said, when he first started talking, I'm thinking, mm. yeah, good, good yep. solid principles. Here's why I'm not going to be voting for it. I'm going to vote against it. No, he's abstaining. And now he might even support the measure. It's a nice little... It's the Tory party in a nutshell. That, well, that, was, <laughs> that interview was the Conservative party. We this have is this principle, think... and unfortunately, <laughs> we're going to have to betray it. Yeah, <laughs> Please elect the... us. It's and he, I'm sorry, he's one of the good ones. He genuinely is one of the good ones. He's very, very sensible on virtually on, everything. On these issues in particular, nanny state issues, lifestyle issues, whatever, there's yep. always a handful of Tories who are willing to stand up and say something, but even fewer who actually vote against yeah. it. And it's extraordinary. That's another example. Well, um, let's go to the polls, because we are asking you about MPs voting today to ban anyone, or abstaining, because uh, on principle, uh, anyone born since 2009 from ever being able to buy cigarettes legally. I want to know, do you support or oppose the ban? Tell us why. Uh, give us a call, 0344 499 text 8. Seven triple two, or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Molly says no democratic government has the right to dictate to people what they put into their bodies. Oh, I think you'll find they rather try to do that in 2021. Smokers should, however, have uh, should have their own medical insurance. That's an interesting. There is a cost. Although I hate to tell you, the cigarette taxes are actually more than pay for the contribution uh, for for people who are getting uh, smoking related diseases. More than pay for it. Uh, William says, I'm a non-smoker, but to me it's just another nail in the coffin of people's freedoms and way too much government interference into people's rights in this country. And Kevin says, we'll do what we want. End of. Quite like that. Uh, you've been getting a touch of the phones as well. Let's go to Ian in Newcastle. Hello, Ian. Hello, good morning. Good morning. What do you want to say? Well, I was listening to the smoking ban. In this, I mean, this has been going on since 2007, really, hasn't yeah. it? In yeah. different ways and all that. The, the government, as you've just said, get an, an extraordinary amount of money through taxation from cigarettes, OK? They don't really... They don't want to ban it. Yeah. They'll pussyfoot about with little things like this. You can't smoke in a public place. You can't... Blah, 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 blah. Now they're going to put the age up. I've smoked since I was about 14. I'm now 66 years old. It does affect your health. There's no doubt about that. It does. Um, I've got a 12-year-old son. I don't smoke anywhere near him. I've gone right down the bottom of the garden. I've got my man shed. Yeah. Right? And what I have to say is this. If the government want to ban it, do it. Completely ban it. Yeah. Ban the sale and manufacture of all tobacco products. Yeah. Do it. Don't start... Right, we'll do this, we'll put this up, we'll put this... But I would like to know then what and where they're going to get the revenue from. Exactly. It's that. billions so, in tax receipts, isn't it? Ian, great point. I get a backboard, ban the whole lot. Thank you very much. Great call. Appreciate that. Uh, coming up after the break, uh, more on this uh, government plan to outlaw smoking. We'll be uh, talking uh, to uh, the IPPR's uh, Chris Thomas. This is Talk TV. I'm Julia hartley Burr. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. 
What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Oh, it's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley-Brew. You're with Talk TV. Now, up to 50 Tory MPs could vote against a controversial new government bill to eventually outlaw smoking by making it illegal for anyone born after the 1st of January 2009 to ever buy cigarettes legally. Well, joining me right now to discuss this is Chris Thomas. He's head of the Institute for Public Policy Research's Commission on Health and Prosperity. Uh, good morning to you, Chris. Good morning. Thank Hi. you very much indeed. Um, look, you know, a lot of people like me, like most people in this country, don't smoke. Uh, most people in this country would probably like not to be around smokers. Everyone in this country knows they are cancer sticks and are bad for you, but we still have some people who smoke. Um, should we bring in a ban that affects, well, children now, but who will be adults in a few years, where we have a situation where two adults born, not even just months apart, but like hours apart, one can be legally allowed to buy a legally sold product and one would be banned from buying it. Is that a sensible law? Yeah, I think I think this is a good idea. Um, I think um, the context for this policy is that the economy that we have in the UK at the moment is is suffering from poor population health that's been decades uh, and years in the making. Um, we have an NHS that's struggling quite badly in terms of sustainability. Um, tobacco uh, and cigarettes are the only consumer product that kills two thirds of its users when 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 used as intended. Um, and look, you have to put the dividing line of a policy somewhere. You can't have a blanket ban um, without any thought for those that currently smoke. It's an addictive product. Um, so you do need that line somewhere. Um, but I don't think that problem undermines this sensible idea that's good for well, the economy, I good mean, for the NHS. I mean, again, everyone's, I think, everyone, I mean, everyone right thinking should be opposed to children smoking. That's why it's illegal for children to smoke. And that's why the ban on buying uh, cigarettes where it was raised from, you know, the year, the year you could buy them from the age 16 to age 18. I think pretty much nobody opposed that. Perhaps probably some 17 year olds who already smoked. Um, I'm, I'm genuine, I'm really anti smoking. However, a lot of people are worried this is, you know, thin end of the wedge stuff. This is slippery slope stuff that actually, when we get to the point where we've got this law actually in force in a few years' time, there is an adult in a shop wanting to buy a legally sold product and someone born a few weeks, a few hours, a few days, a few years ahead of them is able to buy them and they're not. This is going to be a nonsense. Now, will the solution then be dump this silly law? It doesn't work. You can't do you have a law that affects some adults and not others. Or will the solution be let's ban it for everybody? And if that is the solution, What's the next thing that's banned? So it, it, I, I don't think it's slippery slope. I think the number of people for whom that scenario that you've just outlined, um, it, it, it will affect them for will be perishingly small. Um, so the thing to remember with this policy is that the vast majority of its impact will happen in the first 10 to 15 years, i.e. most people that start smoking are teenagers that go on to regret it quite profoundly in later life. What you probably won't get is a load of 30 year olds in say 15 years kind of desperately trying to start smoking that, that that's just not how it works 
Um, so what you actually have is a very small number of people that are still addicted to, to nicotine by the time they're 30 under this policy. But they have quite uniquely, and this is why I think this policy is, is possible today in a way that it wasn't previously, they have alternatives in terms of nicotine that weren't on the market in a prominent way kind of 10, 15 years ago uh, in the form of non-combustible products like vapes. So in fact, there's a readily, readily made alternative for them if, if, if in small numbers they do still have a nicotine addiction. Yeah, I mean, look, so I think- and It's amazing it's to me how many people who are anti-smoking also very, very anti-vaping. I'm not pro-vaping, but it certainly seemed to be a very useful way for a lot of people I know who'd never ever been able to give up smoke, smoking to be able to give up. So it seems to me the crackdown on that has been quite bizarre as well. But you know as well as I do, there are gonna still be people who want to buy cigarettes and they're gonna be buying them on the black market. It's already huge. If you think most people living on council estates on benefits are paying 16 quid for a packet of facts, you know, think again, they're not. They're getting them on the black market already. We're just going to be expanding that black market. Now, as much as I don't want anyone buying cigarettes, I don't want anyone smoking, we have to face the reality. We saw what happened with prohibition in the United States. We see what's happening to a certain extent with, with drugs that are not so widely, uh, you know, demanded. But there are still, you know, there's still a good percentage of people in this country who smoke, who want to smoke, and who are going to want to smoke in a few years' time when they're adults. They're going to get those on the black market. Encouraging criminality, losing the taxation that helps pay for treating lung cancer and heart disease as a result of smoking, is that actually a good solution to the problem? Well, there's lots, lots to unpick there, Julia. I mean, the, the first thing to say is the taxation that's created from cigarette sales does not account for the combined cost of both the NHS's cost, but also the economic cost of people that are sick before the retirement age and therefore not, not but it, producing oh, but, 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 but smokers helpfully dying before they can claim most of their pension does actually pay for it, actually. The, the economics oh, of this it, are it, very, it, very it clear. Because, smokers because smokers people, overall people, claim less. They don't live as long. They don't. Pensions are the biggest single outlay uh, of, the, of the welfare state, and it, they, they end up costing less. That's not true, Julia, because we'd be true. much poorer if no one was alive to work. So um, we do need people to contribute to the economy. No, they, so that's, no, they are alive, um, but they don't claim their pensions for as long. That, that's yeah, well, the economic they, reality. They don't, they, don't, they don't reach retirement age, so the, the economy suffers. We have, you know, kind of today, uh, new data from the ONS, 3 million people out of work because of long-term sickness. That's, that's an absolutely tremendous drag on the UK that's economy. That's not because of smoking. So it, is, it, is a profound cost. It, is, it is partially down to smoking, um, but of course it's down to other public health threats as well. Um, look, in terms of the black market, I think in every case the government uh, proposing a, a tobacco control policy, uh, industry-funded research and, um, and kind of some, some, some voices on the libertarian side of, of politics say the black market will emerge, it's not actually that big. And what you have in this instance is an alternative market for legal vapes that are a cheaper uh, alternative okay. to smoking that I think people will prefer. And I, I, I don't think you'll see a black market emerge. Well, we shall see who is right and who is wrong. Chris Thomas, I really appreciate it. Are you joining us? He's from the IPPR. Thank you for that. Coming up in the next hour, more on Donald Trump's hush money trial and police accused of being too soft on hard drugs. I'm Julia hartley Brewer. you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, son. Oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Ooh, <we're missing. laughs>
There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know, it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail to, her. Yeah, it was supposed to was have another moved on from era. that. She was 22, mm. was supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good morning and welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer and you are with Talk TV. We're on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. And I'm with you live from 10 until 1. Coming up in this hour, former US President Donald Trump was in court yesterday over alleged hush money payments to a porn star. He called the prosecution a scam, a witch hunt and an assault on democracy. Oh yes, and persecution like never before. So unlike Donald Trump to over-egg the pudding, eh? And the police are accused of uh, legalising hard drugs by stealth. That's according to Home Office data, which says that nearly four out of ten people caught with hard drugs aren't now given a criminal record. And we'll bring you an exclusive interview with former Prime Minister Liz Truss. She shares her thoughts on her failed premiership, the Rwanda plan, Keir Starmer and Donald Trump. You don't want to miss that. First, though, let's Will get the world be a safer place uh, after November the 5th this year with President Trump? Uh, in the, back in the Oval Office or President Biden remaining there? It will be safer with President Trump. Why? And I hope he gets elected. Well, you don't want to miss that. First, though, let's get the latest news headlines with Natalia Corcara. Good morning. Fears are mounting over Israel's expected retaliation to Iran's drone and missile attacks. Rishi Sunak is due to speak to the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to urge restraint after his war cabinet agreed to fight back after the weekend bombardment. The former UK ambassador to Iran told Talk TV it's hugely concerning. I don't see myself how it's possible to attack Iran on its homeland without generating a massive Iranian response which would endanger the whole region, the world economy, uh, certainly some Britons in the region and our forces, and certainly American targets. So the decision that the War Cabinet appears to have taken is an extremely dangerous one. The Rwanda safety bill is heading back to the House of Lords for further scrutiny after MPs rejected amendments they'd made to the legislation. The bill seeks to compel judges to regard Rwanda as safe in a bid to clear the way to send asylum seekers who cross the channel in small boats on a one-way flight to the country. Some ministers insist we will see flights take off for the African nation within weeks. Donald Trump has described the hush money case against him as a scam. None of the 96 jurors were selected on day one after some admitted they could not be impartial. It is the first criminal trial to involve a former US president who was accused of falsifying business records to hide payments to adult film star Stormy Daniels, allegations he denies. The chair of Republicans Overseas UK, Greg Swenson, told Talk TV New Yorkers have strong feelings about Trump. 
it's going to be really difficult to find an impartial jury in New York. It's a very hostile jury pool, hostile to Trump. Right. You know, 88 percent of the jury pool is Democrat and, and not just Democrat voted for Biden, but really hostile to Trump. If this trial was in Staten Island, Trump would be acquitted tomorrow morning, you know, they, where they really like it. Police in Australia have declared the stabbing of a priest at a Sydney church yesterday as a terrorist attack. Four people, including the bishop, suffered non-life-threatening issues. A 16-year-old boy who was also hurt has been arrested. We believe there are elements that are satisfied in terms of religious uh, motivated extremism and, of course, the intimidation of the public through that person's acts by attending that church whilst it was being live streamed. Meanwhile, an outpouring of grief continues in Sydney over a separate stabbing which saw six people, including a mother, killed in a frenzied knife attack in a shopping mall. The woman who loaded a gun for actor Alec Baldwin on a film set which killed the cinematographer Helena Hutchins has been jailed. The judge ruled that the actions of Hannah Guterres-Reed, who was the weapons handler for the film Rust, const constituted a serious violent offence, saying if it weren't for you, Miss Hutchins, a wife and a mother, would still be alive. And MPs will debate legislation today designed to give the UK some of the strictest smoking laws in the world. Rishi Sunak wants to make Generation Alpha, born since 2009, the UK's first smoke-free generation, with anyone turning 15 from this year banned from buying cigarettes. But many Conservative MPs are expected to rebel against the plans. That's all from me. Now time for a look at today's weather with Nazanin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello. So it's not looking as windy as it was yesterday, but it's still looking pretty blustery for this afternoon and a northerly wind direction means it's feeling cool despite the sunshine. There will be some showers around in between the sunny spells as well. Some of them could be heavy and thundery with the risk of hail, particularly around parts of the Midlands and eastern and southeastern parts of England. And temperatures around average for the time of year, highs of 12 to 13 degrees Celsius. Now, overnight, a lot of the inland showers will fade away. It stays blustery through the night, so we won't see a widespread frost, but I think we will see frosts in rural spots, particularly around parts of Scotland, and showers will continue around the northeast of Scotland, as well as some coastal areas of the east and west. But otherwise, tomorrow we'll do it all again, another day of sunshine and showers across many areas, and there will also be cloudier skies with spells of showery rain spreading across Ireland and Northern Ireland through the day, later towards western parts of Scotland. A few of the showers turning wintry across the high ground of the northeast of Scotland. Otherwise, elsewhere they are going to be rain showers, perhaps not as heavy nor as thundery as the last couple of days. Then as we head into the weekend, high pressure builds and it looks more settled, calmer and drier. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good morning and welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley-Brew and you are with Talk TV. Still with me, running through all of the biggest stories of the day, Spiked uh, Online editor Tom Slater. Uh, good morning to you morning. once again. Um, question we're asking today, we've had some quite huge debates already, have we not, uh, about this uh, smoking ban uh, that the government wants to bring. This is Rishi Sunak's big announcement at party conference uh, last October. But MPs are going to vote today uh, to ban anyone. We know it's going to go through, despite probably about 50 Tory MPs uh, who are going to uh, vote against, uh, to ban anyone born since since January the 1st, 2009, including January the 1st, 2009, from ever being able to buy cigarettes legally. Uh, so I do want to hear from you. Do you support or do you oppose the ban? And tell us why. You can give us a call on 0344 499 text on 8722, or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Calls are charged at the national rate. Text costs one standard network rate message. Um, love to hear your thoughts. Well, we had some great calls on that and some great messages. Largely people opposed. I think you and I were both rather surprised earlier mm. to have a Tory MP on who says he's massive, you know, free marketeer, anti-big government, government out of our lives, and then said, first of all, this is James Sunderland, he would vote, um, he would abstain, because it was a government measure, although it's not on a whip, and then he said he might vote to support it. I mean, I've got to say, brain, 
what the hell's going on? Yeah, maybe we shouldn't have been surprised, really, in a way, because <laughs> this is what the Tory party does, isn't it, is that they claim to have they talk all of these game. principles on all kinds of issues, and then when push comes to shove, they fall into line with the orthodoxy. This is another example of that. Um, I, I genuinely find this quite depressing. First of all, just from the perspective of somebody who genuinely does believe in individual freedom, I think if you're an adult, you should be able to decide how to live your life. As long you as should... it doesn't... It was... When, the when, when it principle. imposes on other exactly. people, then there's a trade-off, and then that should be a matter. And that's the, that's the, that's John Stuart Mill. That's the classic liberal th thing. If it, as long as it doesn't impact on anyone else, and this, we're at the point now where it really does not impact on. Exactly, I'm, I'm very so, anti-smoking. I love the 2007 smoking ban. I thought was brilliant. I mean, it was indoors as an ex-barmaid, as an ex-waitress, and working in offices where people, you know, sitting there smoking fags. Next, left, right, and in front of me at six in the morning on the evening standard it was absolutely horrific. Well, the smoking ban was also something where things were sort of trending in that direction anyway yeah. as well. well do you know what I mean? And I think pe you people should Do you also remember be... people, vote, people smoking in cinemas and on planes? No, that was slightly before my time. All right, just all right. But, um, all right, all right. Not trying to pl yeah, can we not have such young people on the show? <laughs> we used to sit on the tube in yeah. London, underground, in a, in a, in a tunnel... With people smoking, but also, it's th mind blowing now. Before the smoking ban, I could easily have seen a situation in which you know you'd have places which were smoking, places that were non-smoking. I thought the vast majority probably would have been non-smoking. But I think the point is, is that yes, it's a question of free. It's also a question of what if your main concern is health. Really, is this something that we need to be too yes. obsessed about? Particularly in the context of them also making moves towards clamping down on vaping, yes. which is also in this bill. Or at least giving the powers to the health secretary to clamp down on it if he wants to is also in this bill. I just think it makes no sense. And I think it genuinely produces a less free, less live and let live, yeah. less well, easygoing yeah. society. Health doesn't have to be everyone's no, priority. That's the thing. We, that's that's long, yeah, we need to keep every single 83-year-old alive yeah. for as long as possible at the expense of everyone else's freedom. That, no, that's not how life should work. I used to be very nanny state, actually. Um, I'm not libertarian. I would say li like, yeah, I'm liberal. Um, but again, as, I, I think there's a perfectly justifiable, uh, you know, passive smoking justifications for the, the ban in 2007 on people smoking in offices and in enclosed areas, public spaces. Absolutely, I'm fully in favour of that. As were most smokers I know who were saying, you know, it means I cut down. I have to go outside and have a crafty cigarette in the rain outside, but it means I smoke less. Um, made pubs and clubs much more pleasant to go to. You don't sort of have to, you know, re wash everything out for the next two weeks. But um, but this, I do think this just goes way too far and I don't see how it's tenable. And as one of our callers, Roy, mate, pointed out, you are looking at this impossible to enforce you know, two adults going mm -hmm. to a shop, one's legally allowed to buy and one isn't because they were born in 2008, one born in 2009, um, without ID cards. Yeah. So it's a slippery slope to ID cards. I think it's a slippery slope when it comes to what next is banned, because, you, know, mm -hmm. you know, cakes, sugar, you know, it? anything else you actually... Wine, they're, they're coming for our booze, folks. They're come, Listen, you, you, you're going to have to fight hard to take my, <laughs> take my white wine and my fizz away from you guys. But why wouldn't they, you know? Yeah, it's exactly. the next logical step. And also the black market. I remember when, market, the, yeah. when the smoking the age... the taxation lost. Exactly. I remember when I was about 16 or a little bit more when the smoking age went so up to 18. So that was last year? Um, no, exactly. Not quite. But a long time ago now... You're going to play the young card. Oh, God, how long ago was that? Like 16 years ago? Um, but <laughs> it was... I was just over 16 when they put the smoking age up to 18. So we went from buying cigarettes legally to just buying them illegally. Yeah. That's what we did. We went and bought... And you still managed to get them? Yeah. I mean, I it's knew friends at 14 who were getting them. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. It's, it's quite you bizarre, know. isn't it? Well, I mean, I'd love to hear your thoughts on all of this. Uh, do give us a call in particular. 03444991000 is the number to call. Let's talk about the small matter of World War III. Um, I can't believe we got to that next. Um, but um, we, we have uh, had the extraordinary situation. We've got Ben Wallace, uh, who is, of course, the, uh, the former Defence Secretary, speaking out, as he has done on a lot of issues in terms of our defence spending, our ability to uh, protect our, not just our nation, but our allies, Ukraine, uh, Israel and others. But he has said that Iran is acting like a bully and must be hit back twice as hard. Uh, this as Israel is preparing whatever their reaction will be in retaliation to that missile attack on Saturday night from Tehran. Now, Rishi Sunak has joined Joe Biden and he's got a phone call with Netanyahu today. But it's warning the Israeli Prime Minister, you know, you need to tone this down. We need to not, not you know, basically upgrade everything. But there's no doubt at all, the Iranian attack, the 101, so 301 missiles and, and, uh, and drone attack on Israel and on civilian targets, that was a huge upgrading in terms of their retaliation for the attack uh, by the Israelis on that uh, Damascus, uh, uh, you know, uh, diplomatic compound which had, which killed uh, you know, revol Iranian Revolutionary Guard uh, generals and, and other senior staff. That was a military target. 
And of course, Israel would have known that Iran would hit back. But Iran has massively upgraded this. It is a matter of luck and a matter of the Allies' support for, you know, providing the technology, in the case of America, the Iron Dome uh, defense system, but also American, British, French and Jordanian and other jets shooting down uh, those, uh, uh, those, those missiles that, that we have not seen massive loss of civilian life in Israel. In those circumstances, would the same people demanding that the, everyone, you know, holds fire, would they be making the same demands? Because if, if any country sent 300 ballistic missiles and drones into my country, I'm telling you, mm -hmm. I would expect retaliation. I mean, it's been interesting watching people flip. So they've gone in the space of 24 hours from saying that it was completely understandable, if not justified, for Iran to respond to Israel. They haven't admitted it, but we all know it was them hitting the consulate in Syria, which is full of all of these Iranian generals and so on, saying, that, of course, it's going to elicit a response. Then after Iran sent hundreds of bombs, of ballistic missiles, of drones carrying, carrying explosives and so on, Israel's way, that it's outrageous and wrong and escalation in order yeah. for Israel to respond. But that's how this debate has taken, has taken place. People act as if Israel is the only one who can act. Yeah. But also that Israel's yeah. action in, in, in attacking that Damascus compound was completely out of the blue. Yeah. And just an un, unprovoked just attack. Felt like despite the fact that everyone openly, the same people openly state that Iran is, is funding both Hamas, mm -hmm. the Houthi rebels in uh, in Yemen, and the Hez Hezbollah rockets that are being fired from Lebanon every single day, with uh, you know, you know, tens of thousands of Israelis forced out of their homes in northern Israel. No, don't worry about that. That's fine. That's absolutely fine. They can carry on doing that, but it mm -hmm. would be somehow provocative for Israel to act against the generals ordering those those proxy yeah. attacks. Well, that's been the message, isn't it? People have acted throughout this conflict that it would be provocative and outrageous for Israel to defend itself. That's kind of been where we've ended up. Now, that's not to say that anyone should be blasé about the prospects of this conflict spreading of mm. other powers being sucked in. I don't think there's civilians in either Israel or Iran who are exactly happy about the current state no. of affairs and want their own sons and daughters to be sent into conflict. But the point is, is that we need to recognise who started this, why this war in Gaza is taking place, why Yeah, but then you're, people will place. say, no, but, you know, October the 7th wasn't the start of this. You go mm. back to 19, you know... 75, 45, I mean, you, you know, go back 2,000 years sometimes. Yeah, I mean, we can, we can be, you know, we can, at least we can say with some confidence that when, say, Israel struck that consulate recently, it wasn't out of the clear blue sky. We know that they've been... And yes, there's a lot been made about the fact, and it is significant, that this is the first time Iran has yeah. struck Israel from its own territory yeah. and its own military, but it has been funding and backing exactly. those Exactly. I have to say, I'm, I'm, I, I was... I was most uh, heartened to see the, the uh, Western alliance actually standing by our ally Israel in these circumstances. You know, we're very clear about it around the threat. And I, I've been I was saying on the show yesterday, absolutely fascinated to see the people who are on, on the side of the Iranian mullahs who, who, as a matter of policy, mm. beat young women to death for not wearing a scarf on their head correctly. I mean, if those are your allies, yeah, I'm not sure I feel the need to. We'll worry about your opinion, I have to say. Um, let's also talk about um, uh, Donald Trump. He yeah. um, is uh, back in court. He's on court on a regular basis. This is actually the start of a trial, though, uh, in New York. This is over hush money paid to the porn star Stormy Daniels, uh, as preventing her from, as she claimed, admitting that she was saying that she had an affair with him, that he has always denied this, ahead of the 2016 election. Remember what happened then? Oh, yeah, Donald Trump won. Uh, among the various charges, these are the first criminal charges for a former US president. Among the charges, it's not that he paid this money, totally entitled to pay someone not to tell a story to the papers, uh, but uh, the this money was came out of campaign funds, and that uh, it, the 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 basic the business uh, accounts were uh, were altered to make it appear that this was a, a campaign fund, whereas in fact it was a payment to his lawyer uh, to pay his lawyer back for paying uh, was it one hundred thirty thousand dollars to uh, the porn star. Now it's going to trial. We've already this is just the section where they're actually trying to select the jury, but we did have Donald Trump. I mean, just being Donald Trump, shall we say, <laughs> uh, outside court. Um, let's have a little watch to listen of what Donald Trump had to say as he arrived for a long day in court yesterday in New York. Radical persecution. This is a persecution like never before. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. And again, it's a case that should have never been brought. It's an assault on America. And that's why I'm very proud to be here. This is an assault on our country. Nobody has ever seen anything like it, Tom. In a way, he's right. I mean, that's the thing, as far as this is 
somewhat unprecedented. It's not to say that there haven't obviously been politicians who've been persecuted over time, but in recent times, the way in which the law has been so willfully weaponised against a particular political candidate and across so many different cases. And the, the, this is the problem with Donald Trump, is that there's a lot of things you could get him on. He's not a squeaky clean character by any stretch of the imagination. I think he's probably banged to rights on these... all of the different four court cases he's going to face. It doesn't mean he shouldn't have a fair trial. I'm only allowed to say that because it's not sub judice in the same way yeah. that it is in this country. Uh, I mean, but this, this particular indictment is, good, is a case in point as far as what he's accused of basically, it was basically a bit of creative accounting to try and obscure these payments that were being but made. Yes, but, but it is against the law. No, absolutely. My point is that um, what they then did was they took what should be basically a sort of misdemeanour and then inflated it into a kind of felony. Mm. And, for, and many legal experts in the US have gone over this and said this is kind of cooked. Even liberal outlets have yeah. said this is a little bit too creative. So this is the problem. Yes, he might be banged to rights on one thing, but then it gets blown up into something else. And, and it's the decision it. to and actually bring thing. this case. And that's one of the things, isn't it? It's like, it's, I, I think it's perfectly possible to hold both ideas in yeah. your head at the same time, which is that he, he may well have done this, he may well be guilty. It is perfectly reasonable that there should be a court case about this. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, that the decision to prosecute him in all of these cases is actually politically motivated. Yeah, and and have... the motivation is to try and prevent him from becoming US president. However, it does appear that certainly with all the charges, that has actually done not, not only done nothing to hurt his chances, it's boosted his chances. He's playing the martyr, he does this very well, mm. it's boosted his fund, uh, funding for his campaign. This, however, will have an impact in terms of you have to sit in court every day. You can't go out campaigning. Uh, you can't even attend a Supreme Court hearing uh, regarding another case, which seems to me to be an absurd ruling from the judge and clearly politically minded, could perhaps be banned from attending uh, his son's um, uh, high school graduation, which is you know, a very, very, very big thing uh, uh, for, for American parents. And it just seems to me... Um, that those are vindictive things that, 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 that are going to play very badly with the general public. If I'm feeling sorry for Donald Trump, you've probably gone too <laughs> far, is what I would say. Um, but, you know, he did once say, you know, 2016, and I don't even think he was joking. He was above the law. He could get away with anything. He yeah. could, you know, I could, I could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and get away with it, he said. Well, I think what this... We've also got to think about the consequences for American politics more broadly because this is ushering in a new era in which whatever party is elected, they're just yeah. going to pursue the other one through the courts. And you've got district attorneys who are elected in Manhattan, for instance, where this trial is taking place, on the ticket of I will be the man to bring down Donald Trump. Yeah. This is a politicisation of the law. But they do, but it has been. But it has been. And, I, and that's one of the things I think is fatally flawed in the American judicial system, that, they, that it is a highly politicised system. On this system. scale, though, I think it's something on we haven't scale. seen. I don't because the whole... Out, I'd like to point Trump out that this was started by Hillary Clinton and her, her fans and campaigners mm -hmm. in 2016, where they argued, and again, and we saw this in the UK, all the, all the, all the people on the Remain side, not all, but a lot of people on the Remain side, certainly in Labour, saying that basically the, 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 the 2016 Brexit referendum had been uh, yeah. bought and paid for by the Russians uh, and the like, and lies, um, and, and you know, voters didn't know what they were doing. Um, and we saw that absolutely outrageous undermining of our democratic vote. And we've had the same thing a few months later in November 2016, but Donald Trump got elected fair and square. And there are still so many people online who still seem to think that basically Vladimir Putin won that election yeah. for Donald Trump, whereas all the evidence is very, very clear that actually all of that, those Russian bots actually started after he became president. Now, I've no doubt that Vladimir Putin was very delighted that Hillary Clinton didn't become president and that, and that uh, uh, Donald Trump did. But that's not to say that he was able to interfere with that election. Absolutely. And I think so much of that comes down to that refusal to concede that vote. I mean, Donald Trump was threatening not to concede the 2016 vote before he knew that he won it. So it's yeah. not to say that he's um, the principled person here. But there's so much blame to go around on both sides. We're now in a situation where the leadership of both the main parties are denying election results just in slightly different formats. Yeah. And that there is a not insignificant section of their own bases who believe that either 2016 was stolen by the Russians yeah. or 2020 was stolen by Joe Biden's and Venezuelan voting machines well, or whatever I mean, it was. Yeah. So this is a big yeah. problem. But, but exactly, but again, people can't think it, don't think it just started with what Donald Trump's behaviour post the 2020 election was absolutely appalling and terrible. But you know, so was so was Hillary Clinton's behaviour after 2016. Not, not quite as bad, but it but it was bad. And I, you know, look, I, did, did I did I want Jeremy Corbyn to get elected in 2019? I did not. Um, but what I've accepted the election of the verdict of the British people, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in the next election this year, you know, I have, I have opinions on who I want to get elected and not elected, but I would accept the outcome of a democratic vote. If you don't accept that premise, and if you don't have, you know, the, 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 the you know, calm, 
peaceful transition of power. You know, you may as well go and live in Russia in yeah. that temperature. It's, it's very dangerous. Um, let's also talk about breaking news in the last half an hour. This is fantastic news. Uh, I'm very, very pleased about this. Um, we've got the, the case involving uh, the Michaela Community School. This is the school that was run by the utterly brilliant and wonderful Catherine Burble Singh. Um, much, much maligned, but a hero for many of us in terms of her outspoken views and her no-nonsense attitude about this low, the low expectations uh, of, of, uh, of many teachers, of, uh, of children from poorer backgrounds in schools and she has turned that around with a school that has yes incredibly strict discipline but nevertheless has incredibly good results for children who are on free school meals coming from homes where parents don't speak English uh, from housing estates where they've got drug dealers on the estate she is turning their lives around she's an absolute hero uh, and should be uh, for this entire country but she faced an extraordinary legal challenge against her school's ban on prayer rituals a ban brought in because, and we talked to her on the show about it, because um, uh, basically a number of people started praying uh, in the playground and were basically bullying, encouraging, exerting pressure on other students, Muslim students, uh, to join their, their prayer ban and to join in Ramadan fasting and the like. And she said this was unreasonable and they brought in a prayer ban. They didn't have rooms where kids could uh, pray. There was simply isn't the room in the school. Well, a Muslim student, we're told, brought a legal challenge. Muslim students' parents and activists brought a, music, a legal challenge against the school, um, saying this was uh, basically a uniquely affecting Muslim faith, uh, with prayer as a key pillar of the faith. And uh, this morning, that legal challenge was lost, I'm delighted to say. And sense, common sense has prevailed. This is a great victory for common sense, isn't it? Absolutely, and also a great victory for schools that want to remain secular, that don't want to become subject to the demands of whether it's, it's pupils openly, or teachers. It's openly or a non-faith school. Absolutely, and all, the point that um, Catherine Burblesing has been making very powerfully is that when, particularly when you're in a very multicultural, multiracial, multi-religious area, as her school in Wembley is, is the fact that you really need to find ways to make sure that kids don't kind of fracture into their own little silos. So they yeah. do things that try and bring them all together, whether it's all having lunch together. They all eat vegetarian because of the fact that that is more or less what all of them can yeah. eat despite their respective religious diets and so on. And she was saying that this demand for a prayer room, which they couldn't fulfill anyway, yeah was leading to a kind of general demand that kids, that the Muslim kids be more pious by the more conservative kids yeah. and whatever. And she was like, we have to put a stop to this, precisely because we want to be one yeah. school community. You're not a Muslim pupil up. or a Hindu pupil mm -hmm. or, a, or a Christian pupil, but you're just a pupil at Michaela. That should be something that That's anyone can get behind. That's the whole point of school behind. uniforms as well. Exactly, you're, you're just, yeah. you're, that, that is your identity when you're at school. I think, she, I mean, she stood firm on this one. I'm so pleased. But again, huge cost of this to the courts, huge cost to the school dealing with all of this, you know, and the nonsense. If you don't like it, move your kids to another school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but brilliant stuff. Well done, well done. Big victory there for uh, uh, Catherine Burble Singh. Uh, right now, uh, let's get back uh, though to uh, what we've been asking you on social media and on air uh, about MPs who will vote today uh, to ban anyone born since 2009 from ever being able to buy cigarettes legally. It's all certainly that bill will uh, go through and become law, uh, despite some 50 Tory MPs expected to vote against it. I want to know, do you support or do you oppose the ban? Tell us why. Uh, give us a call on 0344 499 text on 87222 or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Uh, Patricia says uh, the government wants to rule our lives. I'm not a smoker, but let the people decide if we want to smoke. It's amazing how many people like like me aren't smokers opposed to this. Kareem says it's not up to the dictators to decide what we can do. And William says it's completely unenforceable. They'll just start an entirely new drugs and black market. You've also been getting in touch on the phones. Do keep those calls coming in. Let's get to Carlos, who is in London. Hello, Carlos. Oh, hello. The impact of smoking uh, is immense. Uh, working for the NHS, I see uh, uh, all the consequences of smoking. Yeah. It's not just cancer, it's respiratory diseases. It's the effect of unborn, uh, on unborn uh, fetuses. Yep. It's, it's, it's vast, it's immense. Smoking and is also, terrible. They're cancer sticks. I mean, I see a pregnant woman smoking. I mean, we should all, I mean, castigate them. I mean, I'm sorry, you, you, if, you've got, if you're choosing to have a baby, you've got to stop smoking, end off, nothing to discuss. I hate smoking. I don't want to be around it. However, um, however, it, people are allowed to do things that are bad for their health. We're allowed to drink. We're allowed to eat too much. People are allowed to do dangerous sports. Why should the government decide what we are and what we are not allowed to get ill from? Well, when we talk about the NHS, we talk about the budget of the NHS yeah. and how the NHS needs to be more funded. 
Now, the amount of money that we spend, uh, the amount of resources that we spend uh, fighting uh, unnecessarily uh, 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 diseases that could be easily uh, avoided yeah. is the amount of money that we could be spending fighting other things. I don't, like, of course, and, I mean, absolutely. And, 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 and look, I think we have a duty, a, a duty of care to some limited extent to sort of not impose costs on other people. However, smokers also have the decency to die younger, so they don't claim their pension for as long. <laughs> No, that's no. I'm sorry. That's the reality. Is that actually the biggest saving we get from smokers? You say saving, not a cost. Is that they don't live as long, and that's why it's crazy for people to smoke, I, in my view. Uh, and therefore, they don't claim their pension as long uh, and other benefits as long. So, although they might cost us extra from their diseases, overall, and the taxes that are paid, um, VAT and and tobacco duty, they they're net contributors in that sense. They're not drag. Well, but here's the thing: they, they, if you're going they, to use they, the they, argument they, about they, smoking, Carlos. You could also use that argument about people being obese. So are we going to have laws to stop people getting obese as well? Is that acceptable? Well, the, 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 the issue here is, the issue here is, there's also, is a smokers, is passive smokers. Mm -hmm. well, we've is dealt with people, that. The smoking ban dealt with that. Who suffer, who suffer because of the nasty habit of smoking. No, 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 no. We've dealt with passive smokers. You and, don't have to choose. To, you, don't, you don't get forced to be in a room with someone smoking ever anymore. That's rubbish. What about people who are obese? Should we also but bring they, in a law to stop people buying fatty they, food and sugary food? But they're not, but the, the, the fundamental thing is, the fundamental thing is, if you say, OK, I will smoke and I will, I will spend resources and I will waste resources that should be uh, uh, used uh, uh, fighting uh, uh, diseases that people get onto themselves, not because they want to, but because it's just happened, uh, it's ridiculous. No, you uh, say Carlos, that you want, you've that made you that point. NHS, Carlos, that you you've made that point NHS. three times. I'm asking you, what, where does this lead? If you can make that logical argument about smoking, why can you not also make that argument about people eating fatty or sugary food and people getting obese? Obesity is a massive cause of, uh, well, of, of cost the NHS. It's a complex, it's a complex disease. Some it's people, not a disease. Some people, obesity is not a disease. Some people might get, might get uh, obese uh, because of eating, and some people might get obese because of genetic propensity. OK, right. A, it's not so a disease. A, a, B, most deal, people who are... To... Carlos, Carlos, mm -hmm. please do not call up my show and talk nonsense. Most people who are obese are obese because they eat too much and they don't exercise enough, but largely because they eat too much. Simple question. If you could justify... A smoking ban because of the cost to the NHS of people having diseases as a result of smoking. Can you also move to justify a ban on lots of unhealthy foods because of obesity? Yes or no? I, I say to you, the, 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 in terms of the applicability of what people put in their mouths, is a, is a different story. Is a, we should not uh, uh, put the two things together. Smoking is one issue, and eating is another issue. And the, the public two health don't come people together. put it's them like together. It's like oranges and apples. It's two different things. I, look, I, I, I say I, com comparing the two as putting as, as the same thing. It's not that it's I, not. I right. don't think they're the same thing. However, the public health people who want to ban smoking exactly they do they do also want to ban you know the sale of fast food and limit uh, limit what the sugar content in fizzy drinks and things like that as well. They absolutely think of it as the same thing. And if the impact on the NHS is the same, why not treat it the same on the same logic? Well, the, the impact is not the same. A, a, a smoking has gigantic ramifications. It's not just... It's, it's there are more obese people in this country than smokers. There are more obese people than smokers. It's cardiac problems. It's a, people can have a heart issues because of smoking, respiratory issues because of smoking, cancer issues because of smoking. Yeah, and the same with obesity. There are all kinds of things. Uh, it, it's a much more complex reality, no, and I, it's a very expensive reality. The, if you have the, the, biggest, cancer, the biggest impact on the NHS will be from obesity and not from smoking in the coming years. I can assure you of that. Um, I'm just fascinated in the logic of this, Carlos. Great to talk to you. You held your own. Thank you very much indeed. That's Carlos in London. Quick word from Tom Slater on this. This is one of my worries as someone who was very nanny state until a lot of these. Really, I mean, really like, yes, these things are absolutely wrong. I don't like them. I don't do them. Therefore, they should be banned. And then realised, oh, hold on a minute. They're coming for my stuff too. So as much as I hate smoking, I really, I really think it's insane. Genuinely, I think it's insane to smoke.
I think it's insane. It is an absolute madness to cut years off your life for smoking. It's like glass of wine now and then, mm. absolutely worth it. But yeah, that's my view. But it's not my business what someone does if it's not impacting on me or anyone else. I don't want people smoking around their children. I think we need to have some issues dealt with about that. But, but this is the thing. The people who are opposed to the smoking, they seem to be very, very keen on banning everything else as well. Absolutely. And there'd be plenty of people who also think it's insane to even have the odd drink. That's the point, you just make your own choices. We're adults, we should be trusted yeah. to do so, and we shouldn't have it dictated yeah. by the government and, or and, the and chief medical officer And maybe living to the else. last possible moment of your life, but mm. being utterly miserable and skinny and healthy may not be our top priority. Um, love to hear your thoughts. Do get in touch. Show three double four four double nine one thousand. Coming up after the break, more on Donald Trump's hush money trial. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, a trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think but, like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're yeah, supposed it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley. Brewer. You're with Talk TV. Now, former US President Donald Trump was in court yesterday over alleged hush money payments. He called the prosecution a scam, a witch hunt, and an assault on democracy. Oh, yes, and persecution like never before. Joining me right now is Republican strategist and former chair of the Nevada Republican Party, Amy Tarkanian. Good morning to you, Amy. Good morning. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Fact, let's just play, just because it does make me laugh, let's just play a, a, that clip again. I will watch the listen to Donald Trump as he arrived at court in New York yesterday ahead of the start of the uh, period of picking the jurors for this trial. Uh, let's take a look at this. This is political persecution. This is a persecution like never before. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. And again, it's a case that should have never been brought. It's an assault on America. And that's why I'm very proud to be here. This is an assault on our country. 
It's never like Donald Trump to exaggerate, is it, Amy? But is this a political persecution? Uh, there may be a, a little bit of hint to, to that, but uh, it's going to be interesting to see what kind of evidence the judge allows because Michael Cohen, who was known as Donald Trump's fixer at the time, um, actually obtained a line of credit on his home in order to make that alleged hush payment of 130000 to Stormy Daniels. Um, and not only that, he's also uh, recorded the conversation with Donald Trump about that topic. Uh, so if, if those two uh, hard pieces of evidence are allowed, I think that's going to be extremely interesting. And the fact that uh, the check that was issued right after the election to Michael Cohen for reimbursement was included in the accounting and on his business ledger. So there is definitely something uh, not right uh, with this scenario. Yes. And that very well could get him into some hot water. Yeah, but, but it is, is right that, now, according to New York law, a uh, class E felony, um, which would possibly allude to probation, maybe four years in prison. But this is his first offense. So I don't actually see that happening. No, I think most the legal experts are saying it's unlikely to be if he were convicted uh, uh, any prison time. But I mean, this, thing, this isn't about sort of someone claiming they gave a wadge of cash in an envelope to somebody and, you know, and everyone's denying it. And, you know, it, and he said, right. she said, there is cold, hard, black and white evidence, you know, in business accounts. Uh, you know, and and, uh, and formal documents to show that this money was paid. The question is whether an actual offence wasn't recorded. And the key thing is, it's not right. illegal, it's not an offence for Donald Trump or Michael Cohen on his behalf to pay $130,000 to uh, former porn star Stormy Daniels. Um, that's entire, they're allowed to give her any money they want. Apparently, this was a payment, sure. it's claimed, in return for her not telling her story ahead of the 2016 presidential election day. Of course, that was the election that he won. Um, and the argument, some of the arguments in, in some part of the case is that this actually may have affected uh, the, the outcome of the election. I mean, as if anyone thought he wasn't having affairs with uh, porn stars, I think <laughs> is, uh, is, is, I would question there. But and we've got other, another porn star, apparently, also, you know, apparently going to be giving evidence in, in the trial. Um, mm -hmm. But the thing here is, it was the, 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 the business accounts being uh, uh, falsified is the allegation and, and, and all of that. Um, at the current time, we haven't even got a trial really going ahead. We've got the jury being selected. And we had 96 mm -hmm. potential jurors who were brought into court yesterday. And they were asked whether or not they could be impartial. 60 of them basically said no, straight away, they couldn't be impartial. Is it possible right. to find anyone in New York or indeed anywhere in America who isn't partial in one way or the other towards or against Donald Trump? It's going to be extremely difficult because this particular borough of New York, actually 75% went to Biden in, in the last election. And you also have to remember that prior to the former president becoming president, that's where he did a lot of business. So he very well may have already upset uh, certain individuals in, in that industry and, and rub people the wrong way. So I think it's going to be extremely difficult to find an impartial jury. And I think it's going to take some time. And it's interesting because you were discussing earlier, and, and I've seen some of the footage as well, where the president is complaining about the possibility of not being able to campaign or attend his son's graduation. Yeah. But this is a criminal trial. This is not a civil case. And he knows that. And he knows how the rules work. And I know that they have requested that he have that day off to attend his son's graduation. And the judge has not said no. He has actually said, let's see how things go. Let's see how far along we are. Let's see basically if Trump can behave. And as soon as he walks out, what does he do? He starts complaining and moaning <laughs> already about the about the judge. So I, I don't see how he's giving, you know, helping himself. <laughs> no, but playing the martyr, we know that plays well with his base. Um, I mean, it, it's interesting. I mean, sure. I think I think For it would be a very foolish decision by the judge to not let him out for things like uh, the, 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 his son's graduation. Because again, that would look like it was vindictive. But as you say, criminal trials, you are expected to be in court for a criminal trial. Uh, the timing of this 
Congress. We know Donald Trump had tried to move all of these trials. This looks like it's going to be the only one of his trials that he's facing where it will actually take place before the November the 5th election. Um, but, but again, we, we are in interesting territory in terms of what impact this will have. As you say, he can't go out and campaign. He's going to be stuck in court sort of four days a week. Um, is that going to impact on his ability to not just raise money, but, you know, you know rally, rally his supporters? No. And I, I would say if it were you or I or, or anyone else, then yes. But it's Donald Trump. And as you mentioned, he has capitalized um, quite successfully on being the victim and rallying people and stirring up emotions, whether if they're correct or incorrect um, statements that he makes. And so he has plenty of spokespeople to go out there on his behalf. Um, he has a, a very devoted base that follows all of his mass emails. They follow all of his posts on Truth Social. They get reposted on other social media platforms so people don't miss a word that yeah. comes from the former president. So I think he's going to be just fine. And that's why he likes to address the cameras as soon as he walks out of the courtroom. Um, so then that way he can put in his two cents. But he's going to have to be real careful because he's already um, crossed over the lines of, of the most recent gag order. And they were trying to fine him. The, the opposing counsel was trying to fine him $1,000 per for a uh, person that he was attacking that he was told not to. And yeah. he just has the toughest time following he, those Well, he does. Rules. I mean, again, $1,000 a time, he's not going to be bothered by it. But, you know, he's attacking the judge, attacking a prosecutor, um, yeah. you know, the juries. Jurors have to remain anonymous. The daughter of the judge, judge. yeah. Again, the daughter of the judge. I mean, he's even, like, you know, yeah, stuff that, I mean, you just simply wouldn't get away with in this country. And But he could, he could right. find himself in contempt of court and taken down to the cells if he doesn't watch out. Sure, he, he very well could. I mean, he's he's actually the king of walking the fine line. And so it, it's quite uh, something to, to witness. It um, It's uh, discouraging, I think, as an American citizen who really just wants to see justice be served, um, it, it get in and get out. But he, he doesn't seem to have a problem with yeah. wanting to drag this on. He doesn't. It's fascinating. And no doubt we'll be talking about this many times with you, Amy Tucker, yeah. and Republican strategist. Thank you for joining us. A uh, quick uh, word uh, from Tom Slater from Spiked Online, who's joining us in the studio. No, I mean, what a circus. Anything involving Donald Trump yeah. always is. But they've handed him this propaganda opportunity. And yet it's going to put off some people, but there's a large part of his base who think he's got a point, because he kind of does when he says they're... But a lot of polls saying that of the floating voters, the independent voters who do decide elections in the key swing yeah. states, that actually something like 50% of those who would support Donald Trump mm -hmm. are saying if he's convicted of a crime, yeah. then they wouldn't support him. Mm -hmm. That's quite telling. I think it is, but it's also telling, I think, of people just wanting the craziness to stop. We've ended yeah. up in such a bizarre situation where actually Donald Trump is, the, is considered by many voters to be almost the more stability candidate because of how yeah. bad Joe Biden has ruled in America. But yes, yeah. it's not to say that this is a flawless strategy for him. If it goes up to that point, that's where we things really We shall see, won't we? Well, look, um, let's get back to our calls and our uh, messages from you about MPs in this country doing rather duller things, voting today to ban anyone born since 2009 from ever being able to legally buy cigarettes. Do you support or oppose the ban? You can tell us why as well. Give us a call on 0344 1000 text 8722 or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Richard has done that and says, prohibition only profits organised crime. Tom says, as a child back in the heyday, if you wanted some you would just ask a shopper to buy them for you. This law will lead to those days again. Andy uh, says, uh, Britain used to pride itself on people being able to make choices. It's my body and it should be my choice what I put in it. You've also been on the phone lines as well. Richard is in York. Good morning to you, Richard. Good morning. How are you? Very well indeed. Thanks for joining us. So are you for or against this ban? Um, well, let's get a bit of... Um hypocrisy in it. It seems to me that Tory seems to, seems to be saying we should have free will to do all these things and smoke, yet we've got a smoking that kills and drugs that don't kill that are illegal. So the whole thing which, is Which up. drugs that don't kill are illegal? Cannabis. There's some very big health issues with cannabis, certainly, well, certainly the yeah, cannabis that's on the market cannabis, these days. Illegally grown cannabis is the dangerous kind of cannabis. Legal cannabis isn't. 
doesn't cause... It depends on the... I don't think the legality affects its strength. I think, well, there's some arguments that people have, it's got stronger when it's been illegal, so it's people to make more money. But um, they, one of the reasons why cannabis and other drugs are illegal is because they're sort of, they're not as widespread. We know they cause harm. If someone introduced smoking now, there's no way in the world it would get, you know, licensed to, and be able to be sold on the market. We were just kind of stuck with it from centuries ago. But, but the cannabis thing is far more recent in this country, which is why it's, I think, you know, it is possible to ban it because it's a, it is, and most people don't realise it's a very much a minority pursuit. Shouldn't we keep bans on things that are dangerous for people? Well, then we need to ban smoking. But there's an argument that lots of people already do it. It's been widespread. It's gradually getting less and less. Whereas well, if I you... think there's a lot of people that smoke cannabis out there. There are it's a lot of people, but yield, nothing the on the yield, same scale as smoking it, or drinking. Nothing on the same it's scale. The high, it's the high-yield, illegally-grown products that cause the mental illness. Do you think, though, that realistically that we would lose the whole organised criminal element to cannabis if, if, you have if to we legalised legalise all it? legalise drugs. Legalise all drugs? Yeah. Heroin? Peter Bletchley, he knows. Legalise and, re and regulate... So we'd, we'd, add, we'd, we'd just allow people to buy heroin? Yes. I mean, I genuinely I think that's mad. Is that, that, well, you speak to any doctor, you speak to anybody in the field of, of drug research, and they I will have. tell you Many that's a time. what needs to be done. Many a time. I don't, I don't think legalising it solves a problem. I think a lot of the countries that even legalising cannabis, I think a lot of them are now questioning whether that was a good move. Look, Richard, I would love to talk to you longer, and I'm sorry to hurry on, but I'm going to have to go to a break. Please do call in again. I bet you this topic will come up again. I so appreciate your call. Thank you. After the break, we are going to be talking actually about a very similar subject. Police are accused of legalising hard drugs by stealth. Uh, four out of ten people caught with them aren't actually ever given a criminal record. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer, and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're yeah, supposed it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Well, welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You'll be talking TV. Well, following on from our call there uh, just a few moments ago, Richard, uh, we're going to be talking about legalising hard drugs. Well, it's kind of been done by stealth. Uh, that's what the police are accused of doing now. According to new Home Office data, nearly four out of ten people caught with hard drugs aren't now given a criminal record. Well, let's uh, talk about this right now with Harry Miller. He's a former police officer and founder of the brilliant Fair Cop. Uh, good morning to you, Harry. Yeah, yeah. Hi, um, hi Julia. Yeah. Again, see. another bonkers story, isn't it? Well, you say a bonkers story. I, don't, I mean, we may have different views on this one. I mean, I've not, and I've not got much time, and it's my fault I've not. But, but basically, saying people caught with class, caught with class A drugs like cocaine and heroin are being let off. They're not being given a criminal record. Do you think they should or they shouldn't be? No, I think I think they should be. Uh, the fact of the matter is, violent crime is intrinsically linked to drugs. So when you start, in effect, decriminalising class class A drugs. You've got a serious problem. Class A drugs, where you find Class A drugs, you will find Class A criminals. And it's the job of the police to disrupt these supply chains, not to downgrade the supply yeah. chains. You've got to get in there and you've got to stop it. Now, I saw in that report that community resolution orders are being used now um, instead of prosecuting uh, people who deal in and, and use Class A drugs. Well, community resolution orders, they are there for very minor disputes. So, for instance, if two neighbours fall out and one breaks the window of, uh, of the next door neighbour, then rather than prosecuting, you use a community resolution yeah. order. Not where everybody using hard drugs. Not to do it again. Yeah, well, yeah. The, it's the, got nothing to do with no. dealing with class A Well, I mean, that's drugs. the key thing, isn't it? It's not up to the police to decide the law. We've had, you know, democratically elected members of parliament to, to decide the law and people can campaign to, you know, get laws, tight, laws tightened or, or loosened. But that the law is the law of the land. But do you think there's just this whole thing in the media and political classes, and I imagine in you know the justice world as well? Well, oh, we know they know loads of people who do cocaine. They might well do it themselves. They smoke cannabis. It's complete. They don't want their kids criminalised, do they? Um, and and there's just a much more relaxed attitude among that particular group of people. Well, we've got to decide, as you say, we've got to decide: is it against the law or not? Yeah. That's that's the thing. And if it's against the law, we've got to deal with it. Now, I noticed that the police say, "Oh, we can't do anything because we haven't got guidance." Well, since when did we elevate guidance to the position of law? We have a law, and it's the police's job to enforce the law. If the community don't like the law, it's their job to lobby politicians to change the law. But yeah. what we mustn't do is continue to rely on guidance. The law is the law. It's the police's job to enforce it. And particularly when it's around class A drugs, which are intrinsically linked to class A crimes. Yeah. You I cannot turn a blind eye to it and then moan about violence and county yeah. lines and illegal immigration and you know people trafficking because all of it is interlinked. It's all part and parcel of the same supply chain. So if you care about any of those things, you need to care about class a drugs yeah. uh, and you need to have a police force that is willing to deal with it it's uh, as simple as that julia absolutely and an awful lot of people again who do those drugs they chose to ignore a lot of that side of it completely ignoring how these things get into the country um is legalizing it the answer though you've got about 10 seconds yes or no no absolutely not i don't think certainly not class a drugs no yeah. criminalize them absolutely criminalize them okay. get them off the streets they are a scourge on society with you all the way on that one. I know a lot of our audience might disagree, but do get in touch. Uh, Harry Miller, former police officer, founder of Fair Cop, thank you very much. Apologies for the time being so short. Uh, still with me is Tom Slater, editor of Spiked Online. Um, you, you're quite liberal on these things, mm. aren't you? I think, I think the war on drugs has been a catastrophic failure. I'm surprised Did that so many it? MPs are trying to extend it. And prohibition has always been a tremendous failure. But I agree with Harry completely that you have laws we don't. Yeah. You've got to enforce It's not up to the police to decide, exactly. So. Uh, well, brilliant. More from Tom Slater. And coming up in the next um, hour, my, even, uh, my full interview with former Prime Minister Liz Truss and the Culture Secretary calls for trans women to be banned from women's sports. Well, yeah, obviously, because they're men. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer, and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man.
Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed it was to another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV. We're on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. I'm with you live from 10 until 1. Uh, coming up in this hour, in just a few moments, I'll bring you my full exclusive interview with former Prime Minister Liz Truss. She shares her thoughts on her failed premiership, the Rwanda plan, Keir Starmer, Donald Trump, much, much more, including whether she'd do anything differently if given her time in office again. Plus, the trans battles continue. Culture Secretary Lucy Fraser has told sports chiefs that trans women athletes should be banned from competing against women because they're men and have an indisputable advantage. First, though, let's get the latest news headlines with Natalia, Natalia sorry, Horkera. Good afternoon. Fears are mounting over Israel's expected retaliation to Iran's drone and missile attacks. Rishi Sunak is due to speak to the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to urge restraint after his war cabinet agreed to fight back after the weekend bombardment. Hotam Kofino, the Jewish News UK foreign editor, told Talk TV the Israelis have decided to fight back. What I'm hearing is that the war cabinet has agreed that Israel will strike Iran. What they haven't agreed on is, is which option. Now, the IDF has presented a number of options for the cabinet, and they're currently discussing which one to go with. The Rwanda safety bill is heading back to the House of Lords for further scrutiny after MPs rejected amendments they'd made to the legislation. The bill seeks to compel judges to regard Rwanda as safe in a bid to clear the way to send asylum seekers who cross the channel in small boats on a one-way flight to the country. Some ministers insist we will see flights take off for the African nation within weeks.
Donald Trump has described the hush money case against him as a scam. None of the 96 jurors were selected on day one after some admitted they could not be impartial. It's the first criminal trial to involve a former president. He was accused of falsifying business records to hide payments to adult film star Stormy Daniels, allegations he denies. The chair of Republicans Overseas UK, Greg Swenson, told Tor TV New Yorkers have strong feelings about Trump. It's going to be really difficult to find an impartial jury in New York. It's a very hostile jury pool, hostile to Trump. Right. You know, 88 percent of the jury pool is Democrat and, and not just Democrat voted for Biden, but really hostile to Trump. If this trial was in Staten Island, Trump would be acquitted tomorrow morning, you know, they, where they really like it. Police in Australia have declared the stabbing of a priest at a Sydney church yesterday as a terrorist attack. Four people, including the bishop, suffered non-life-threatening issues. A 16-year-old boy who was also hurt has been arrested. We Meanwhile, and there are elements that are satisfied in terms of religious uh, motivated extremism and, of course, the intimidation of the public through that person's acts by attending that church whilst it was being live-streamed. Meanwhile, an outpouring of grief continues in Sydney over a separate stabbing which saw six people, including a mother, killed in a frenzied knife attack in a shopping mall. Some patients having lung transplants on the NHS will also receive a skin patch graft from their donor. It is hoped that this will act as an early warning system for possible organ rejection because if a rash on the donated skin patch appears, then this is an indication that treatment is needed. More than 150 patients are taking part in this trial. And the countdown to the Olympic Games is well and truly on, with the Olympic flame lit today at a ceremony in Greece's ancient Olympia, the home of the first Games in 776 BC. The torch will now travel 3,000 miles through Greece before heading to France. It will eventually arrive in Paris in July for the start of this year's competition. That's all from me. Now time for a look at today's weather with Nazanin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, it was rather windy over the last couple of days. It's still looking blustery for today with some showers about. Fairly cloudy as well, but not as windy as it was yesterday. And eventually, the winds will calm down as we head into the weekend and high pressure takes over. But before then, still quite a blustery day and a cool northerly airflow. So despite the sunshine, it is still going to feel quite nippy out there. And there will be some showers in between the sunny spell. Some of them could be heavy and thundery with the risk of hail, especially around parts of the Midlands, eastern and southeastern England. Temperature-wise, around average for the time of year, 12 to 15 degrees Celsius. Not feeling that mild in the sunshine, though, with those northerly winds. Then overnight, the brisk winds continue. Showers will also continue around parts of the northeast of Scotland, eastern areas of England, and some out towards the west. But many of the inland ones will die away. With the brisk winds, it should be a mostly frost-free night, but there will be a patch of frost, I think, in some rural areas, especially for Scotland. And then for tomorrow, lots of sunshine and dry weather to begin the day, but into the afternoon, showers become more widespread once again, especially around northern and eastern parts of the UK. And at the same time, Ireland and Northern Ireland will become cloudier with showery spells of rain later spreading to parts of the west of Scotland. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good afternoon. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer and you are with Talk TV. Uh, in just a couple of moments, we'll be bringing your exclusive uh, Talk TV interview with Liz Truss. But uh, still with me in the studio is editor at Spiked Online, Tom Slater. I want to bring some breaking news to you, everybody, um, and uh, get your thoughts on it, Tom. Police in Brussels have moved to shut down an ongoing gathering of what Politico are calling Europe's hard right elite. It includes Nigel Farage... Uh, Miriam Cates, Tory MP, as well as Braverman, our former Home Secretary, uh, and, and also Matthew Goodwin, uh, who's a political academic. Uh, but the National Conservatism Conference, also, by the way, welcoming Liz Truss uh, today, was set to welcome the Hungarian leader. Again, 
whether you'll agree with him or not, democratically elected Viktor Orban um, over the next few days. But law enforcement arrived two hours into the event uh, uh, in Brussels to inform organisers the event would be terminated because of the possibility of public disorder. Um, I mean, this is extraordinary in a, you know, I mean, heart of Europe, heart of you know, democratic EU, ha, 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 um, shutting down a debate uh, and a conference uh, because people think there might be violence. It's absolutely outrageous. And you know that's all spurious. They just yep. don't agree with this conference. They don't like some of the people I'm who are invited them hard to it. Right. I mean, sorry, is, is Miriam Cates? Is there a problem? Yeah, I mean, noted fascist Miriam Liz Cates, <laughs> Tory hard, MP, you know. Hard right. This, this is the problem, isn't it? It's the fact that um, because there is this sort of demonisation of anyone outside of a certain orthodoxy, they suddenly get labelled this. It's perfectly fine for anyone in the authorities in Brussels or in polite society to disagree with some of the people yeah. invited to this conference. There's some on that list who, you know, I certainly wouldn't agree on with many yeah. issues. But that's not the point. You allow people to speak. You allow people to meet. You don't demonise people yeah. by throwing But, but also, up. if someone is threatening and, violence, we're assuming from the left, yeah. OK, well, who else is going to be threatening violence against this hard right, in inverted commas, conference? Um, then, then you should deal with that. And it's the same as people being cancelled because they want to talk on trans issues at a university. If activists on one side are... I was reading it, you draft in more police. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely I, I think it's, it's obviously just a flimsy pretext and it's just a yeah. reminder that you, you can't trust the supposedly liberal elites with freedom of speech. They're dreadful. You absolutely school. can't indeed. Tom Sayer, thank you very much. Well, let's move on. Now, earlier in a Talk TV exclusive, I spoke to a former uh, Prime Minister, Liz Truss, apparently... Hard right, according to this, um, uh, where she shares her thoughts on her failed premiership, the Rwanda plan, Donald Trump, and whether Keir Starmer really believes that women can have a penis or not. Uh, this was all on a publicity tour for her brand new book, partly a memoir, partly her thoughts on the future of the country, 10 years to save the West. Well, I started off by asking her about her premiership. The first question I need to ask you really is, um, 49 days you were prime minister, you were facing huge amounts of uh, criticism, mockery. The Daily Star had, you know, I don't, lettuce. Read, I don't read that paper. Uh, probably not, but <laughs> everyone else suddenly did, didn't they? We had the lettuce. Did the lettuce or Liz Trust, would they last the longest? Um, question, looking back on it all now, after you've written the memoirs, would it have been better to have been the Prime Minister, the best Prime Minister we never had in some people's minds, than to have served just 49 days and left office under the circumstances you did? Do you regret coming Prime Minister? I mean, sometimes I do think, was I just facing an impossible task? And given the policies I wanted to pursue, cutting taxes, getting the economy going, doing things like fracking, you know, making Britain successful, getting out of our stagnation, was it actually possible to deliver those given the massive resistance from the economic establishment, but also the fact that not enough Conservative MPs were frankly prepared to back those types of policies. I do think that. But then I think, well, if I hadn't tried, would I regret it now? And I just think in politics, you know, the I never thought Boris Johnson should have been deposed. I thought it was a massive mistake. And I was not desperate to put myself forward. I just felt I felt compelled to because I felt there were serious issues that we needed to deal with as a country and as a party, and they just weren't being put forward by the other, the other people. So... Uh, you you I, don't I, I'm the Would kind Would you of do person, it again? Yes. You would I'm do the it again. kind of person, Julia, you know, in a room, if nobody's putting their hand up, I put my hand up. Right. And it is... It's my nature. So... They, do I regret the way it turned out? Of course I do. Um, do I think I was in an impossible position? Yes, I do, just given the level of resistance. These are, you know, my conclusion in the book is we need to build a much more powerful conservative movement and infrastructure who are prepared to be brave to take on you know, what is now a very strong leftist establishment. And we can see that in every area from net zero to wokery to the economy. You know, the left have been in the ascendant and, you know... To well, Tony Blair left office but left pretty much all of his appointees in every quango running pretty... But he also created every national quangos. Institution. He created quangos. You know, he created the Supreme Court, you know, which is now stopping the government implementing perfectly legitimate immigration policy. So 
we did not do enough to get rid of that Blairite sludge, which is now stopping us doing anything. And, you know, I tried to take them on. You and did try to take I got them on. thoroughly trashed I for mean, trying to do in it. Your, in your memoir, you've, you've talked about how, you know, he was up against the Bank of England, the Office for Budget Responsibility, the civil service. I mean, this entire institution, many in the media, as you point out, many in your own party, including you know senior figures in the party who who were opposed to what you were doing, is that just a conspiracy theory, or was it was it maybe the policies that you were putting forward that were wrong? Was it the style in which you put them forward? Were there mistakes that you made? For instance, people saying you know you put a cabinet together where you basically said if you didn't support me early on tough, you aren't part of it. You didn't build a coalition, you didn't communicate properly. Is it, is it all their fault or do you take any of the blame? So first of all, on the subject of the cabinet, I had lots of my opponents in the leadership election in the cabinet, such as Kemi Badenoch and Penny Morden. So I don't think it's fair to say it was a cabinet of true trust believers. I mean, the, the problem is after 12 years in power, there were quite a lot of people who felt that they should be in the cabinet yeah. and you can't please everybody to say the very least, which is certainly a lesson I learned. <laughs> <laughs> I learned the hard way as prime minister, but I don't, I don't think there were easy decisions of that kind to make. I mean, my view is that the policies were right. You know, absolutely that- You stand raising, by, you stand I stand by all by, the policies, I 45 stand by, tax cuts. I stand by all of them. Mm -hmm. I believe that if those policies have been in place and actually, this has been confirmed by a number of you know, free market economists. If those policies had been in place, Britain would be in a better position now. Our energy would be cheaper if we'd got on with fracking. You know, we'd be attracting more corporations to the UK if we would kept corporation tax low. Look at what's happened since. You know, we have seen continued economic stagnation because that economic consensus hasn't been taken on. Now, I said this in the leadership election, I'm not the slickest presenter. I've never claimed to be that. Did I have the political infrastructure ready to step into number 10? No, I didn't. And what, what frankly horrified me, Julia, was just the lack of support in general. Yeah, you, and, and your memoir is, is fascinating, is, in just practical support oh, in terms of, you talked about shopping. and some of the experts, getting, a, getting a food delivery. I know, this goes back to the point about it was a mistake for the Conservative Party to get rid of Boris for many reasons, but it is very hard to take over mid-term mm -hmm. with a bold agenda to change things. That And we get was back it, to was the it, Was it the timing then, to a certain extent? Because we were coming out of COVID, coming out of lockdown, but in the situation where um, you know, the, the country was reeling, I mean, emotionally, but that actually people weren't ready for that and it was the wrong, it was the wrong time and perhaps coming in and just trying to get everything back on an even keel post Boris Johnson would have been the right solution at that time. Or but did you that feel the that right solution, first 100 days, I've got to get everything if done? If that was the right solution, I was the wrong person because okay. I'm not somebody who wanted to become prime minister to be prime minister and do nothing. I felt that people had voted for change in 2016 when they voted for Brexit. They voted for change again in 2019 when they voted for Boris. I felt we hadn't done enough of that change. You know, whether it's the EU laws still being on the statute books, which they are, it's not getting on with some of the trade deals we should be doing, not getting on with the things like fracking, which would help deliver. You know, so I felt things needed to change. We were in a quagmire. Fundamentally, fun, and this is what I said all this during the leadership campaign. You know, we've had a long period of stagnation. It, why are people frustrated? People are frustrated because their cost of living is going up and yet their income isn't going up as much as their cost of living. And ultimately, if you want to win an election, I believe it's about the fundamentals. It's not, people don't, people don't really register what press release Downing Street puts no. out. What they care about is, you know, what are my bills? Yeah. Have I got good opportunities? Is my can kid's a, school can I get a doctor's is my kid's school telling me telling you know that there's a hundred genders, whatever? Yeah. You know, that's what we'll people come to all care. Of that. But that's what people care about. And I I wanted to change the fundamentals. And the, okay, the biggest problem I don't think was public perception. I think it is the fact that the you know, and it's it's not a conspiracy. I'm not saying it's conspiracy. I'm saying it's groupthink. Mm -hmm. There's establishment groupthink in this country 
it reflected in what the Treasury and the ABR and the Bank of England think, which is Britain can't really grow that fast. You know, we've got to raise taxes. Big government's a good thing. The government basically makes decisions better than people do. Mm -hmm. We need to keep close to the EU. We don't really want to change our laws. We don't really want to get tough on China because, you know, and, and that is the mentality. And, and what I really discovered in number 10 is trying to shift that mentality. You know, it wasn't, wasn't going to happen there. And then I mean, wasn't going to happen. You thought the country needed fundamental change. But for some reason, you think that Boris Johnson was the right man to remain in office when, you know, he's pro, he's been, you know, he's been pro net zero. He's pro mass immigration. Was, I mean, what did you Boris think would have I, changed under Boris Johnson? Boris and I don't agree on everything. And in particular, I think China is something we don't agree on. And also net zero is something we don't agree on. But he does believe in lower, lower taxes. We discussed that uh, when I was uh, back when I was foreign secretary and trade secretary. He does want to see a dynamic economy. He does want to see deregulation. And you know, people had voted for him. I think a democratic mandate is really important. And You've got to have a very good reason for okay. getting rid of a leader midstream. You've brought up net zero a few times. In talking mm. about growth, um, I've often interviewed uh, the, the, the Secretary of State who you know, claims to be for you know, energy security and net zero. And I've always pointed out it's an either or, it's not an and. You can't be in favour of both. Um, back in August 2022 at the hustings for the leadership election that you did win, you told me, I support net zero by 2050. Now, you went on to say that there are lots of provisors, better ways of delivering it and making it more efficient, more flexible, based on an enterprise economy. Net zero is one of the main reasons why we are not energy mm. sufficient, energy secure, why we've had the massive, massive hike in energy prices that were one of the reasons why your government was brought down, why America's doing just fine economically and why we're not. How can you look me in the eye and say, I support net zero by 2050? and still claim to be pro-growth? Well, I don't, I don't support it anymore. So what's I mean, changed you, since you, 2022? Well, I've been convinced by your arguments, Julia. Well, I should have. <laughs> if more politicians listened to me, then we'd be in a much better place in this country. So, so what, what... You said categorically you supported it. Well, I, I did. And what changed? What new facts well, have come out? Well, first of all, I, I supported it. I also wanted to get on with fracking. But what, when I look in more detail, about what has happened. I think that any, it was the legislation to put it in. So I'm all for making the environment cleaner. Yeah. I'm happy with renewables provided they compete in the open market. And you know, there's nothing wrong with trying to decarbonize the economy. I think what's, hap what's wrong is the way we've put it into law and that law is essentially constraining people's opportunities, you know, whether it's on maintaining an, a, you know, a gas boiler or whether it's on driving, uh, driving a vehicle. And you know, to some extent at that time, and this is true on various policy areas, I was trying to appeal to a broad range of people in the Conservative Party. Yep. And now... No, frankly, no, I'm, I'm saying. Not. Well, no, now I don't. I don't have to keep Conservative MPs on board, which is a pretty tough. So you didn't really challenge. believe it when you said it. Well, I believed in net zero to 2050. I did say I wanted to change things to make it did, easier yeah. to get to. Uh, I think I would be more. Uh, I've moved on it. In the same we way, we should prioritise actually, economic I've, growth. I've actually there. moved on a number of issues okay. because. And, and I think this is, the, this is the journey many Conservatives have been on, that it, initially things like the Equality Act or the Climate Change Act, they sound like nice things, yeah. don't they? You know, who could be against the environment? Who could be against equality, Julia? But when you look at the real, cha the real effect it's had mm -hmm. on the ability for government to get things done or the real costs it's had for people, then, yes, you have to be prepared to... To think but, again. But again, but again, okay, the Equality Act was 2010, but again, we had, last time I looked at a, a Tory government for 14 years that could have made changes to that, and Tory government that enacted, enshrined under Theresa May in 2019, uh, net zero by 2050 in law. I mean, so many of the problems that we've got right now are actually as a result of 
conservative policies or conservatives failing to turn back the clock or changing policies which are in place which are causing those problems. Is that the sort of blob group think that you're fighting against? So we have made, you know, we have made some good changes. So whether it was education reform, I think our education system is much better. Brexit itself, the trade deals we did, standing up for Ukraine. So, but you are right in that we did not do enough to turn around the Blair legacy. And that has fundamentally stymied us from pursuing the policies that we ought to be pursuing. And we've also given too much ground to the extreme left because what happens is in one minute it's we need to do more on climate change. The next minute it is right, you're not allowed to drive a car or have a boiler. Yeah. And there was too much appeasement of those leftist arguments. And I think I say in my book, I think the environment is the biggest area we've lost the argument on. Mm -hmm. And we now need to win the argument back for free market environmental policies, not these top-down status policies. So, and it, what, what was my personal role in that? Well, on some of it, I got it right. So on gender self-ID, I stopped that. Even though yeah. there was a lot of pressure in parliament to do that, I stopped it. On other areas, you know, maybe I as well went uh, went along with too many of these things. You went along with certainly... lockdown, didn't you? I don't remember you ever speaking out against lockdown. It was a freedom well, I fighter. Out, I spoke out within in, within, cabinet? within any cabinet meetings. I was actually invited to to talk about it because quite a lot of the many. decisions were not made. Did you by that, cabinet? They did were you made... think that any of the lockdown decisions were wrong? Well, definitely later on. I, I mean, to be honest, I was so shell shocked as I think a lot of people were by what was happening. I didn't really okay. know. I, mean, I was I was trade secretary trying to do trade deals and I was literally watching TV and Boris Johnson announced it. I didn't know anything about it. So, <laughs> Which tells us another problem with that complete lack of cabinet government that we've seen over the last years. Let me come on to some of the policies. Uh, I think you might find from my book that cabinet government is a bit of a myth. Yeah, I, I, well, <laughs> it certainly is these days, that's for sure. Let's talk about some of the policies that are around right now. Um, Rwanda plan uh, votes in Parliament uh, this week. We're going to see realistically by Friday the safety of Rwanda bill uh, going into law. Um, first of all, do you think we're actually going to see any uh, channel migrants on a flight to Rwanda at any point uh, this year or ever? And B, do you think that that policy will have any deterrent effect on channel migrants? So I do hope that we will see that, but I certainly couldn't guarantee that from what I know about the situation. I mean, what we know is a perfectly legitimate government policy, which was developed under Boris Johnson, has been thwarted by the courts. And that is a huge problem for our, for our democracy. And I've talked about how I don't think the Supreme Court should even exist. I think it's a Blairite creation. What's wrong uh, with the Supreme Court? We've got the High Court, we've got the Appeal Court. Having the highest court in the land be the Supreme Court as opposed to a court in a foreign land. Well, I don't, support, I don't support a court in a foreign land or, either. But I think pre-2005, we had a Lord Chancellor mm -hmm. who sat in Cabinet who was responsible for the appointment of senior judges. Mm -hmm. And we had a democratically accountable system. We now don't have that. And that to me is a problem. And so I do support leaving the ECHR, These European but I don't, think right. it's, I don't think it's enough. I think if we don't sort out our domestic legal system, we will still have a problem with activist judges and lefty lawyers. I think that is a... That is reality. So on Rwanda, yeah. I do think if the policy, if we can implement the policy, it will work. I think the difficulty has been actually getting the policy implemented. Again, putting it. It's a bit a like what I was saying about the mini budget. I think yeah. if those policies in place, they would work. The problem I had was getting them implemented. Yeah, but again, if you're talking about a few hundred uh, channel migrants ending up in Rwanda, I mean, most channel migrants who've taken the odds, played the odds of, of getting across the channel, and those you know, dangerous, um, busy routes uh, across the sea, they're going to take the odds of whether or not they get sent to Rwanda. This isn't the same as the Australia policy, where you never set foot in Australia, end of story. I mean, I think that for the longer term, we need to develop that type of relationship with more countries apart from Rwanda, I think we need to look at other solutions. But I certainly, looking at it at the time, and I was Foreign Secretary uh, when it was introduced, 
I felt it was a step in the right direction to yeah. providing that deterrent effect that doesn't exist at the moment. And I think it's interesting that the system or the establishment or whatever you want to call them are fighting hammer and tongs against yes. it. They're fighting hammer and tongs against it. And a policy that's very popular with voters. It? Why are they doing that? Probably because they know it will work. <laughs> OK. That's why um, they're doing it. Is there any political will that you could detect among the Conservative Party, or indeed this government under Rishi Sunak, for the Rwanda policy to work to thwart channel migrants? Rishi Sunak said, you know, one of my five pledges, I'll stop the boats. No one thinks he's going to stop the boats. The, the numbers have come up, have gone up in, in, the, in the last few months compared to the same time last year. Um, do, do you believe there is actually any honest, you know, in their hearts, political will to deal with this issue? I think that there is a fundamental problem that there are too many Conservative MPs who don't support changing our institutions, don't support leaving the ECHR, don't support the type of change I'm talking about to our judicial system that is actually going to restore democratic accountability. I think that is the problem. And it's an issue I faced with some of the policies I was pursuing that I simply didn't feel that I actually had a parliamentary majority to put those policies through. So we spent a lot of time in the Conservative Party talking about who our leader should be, in fact, yeah. a disproportionate amount of time. But actually, if you don't have enough MPs... But you, who you had a majority support... of, what, 60 plus at the time? But there are, on paper? there are plenty of people who publicly will not support leaving the HR. ECHR will not support you know, changing our court system. He won't challenge... Why the, do you think they, they won't? They won't challenge the leftist drift, drift why, of why our won't institutions. They? Is it because they want to go... I always say the thing, do they just want to go to the right dinner parties? Yeah, they want to the go back? to these dinner parties. You know, the, the mythical... Do you get invited to these? Well, no, I don't. I don't. I... I actually managed to offend some people because I said I didn't get invited to these London dinner parties. I say, Liz, you've been round for dinner at my house. It's like, that's not the type of London dinner <laughs> okay. party I'm talking about. This is about being of... thought of as a nice person it's, on it's social media. It's a nice media. person. It's, you know, do you get a position on a corporate board? You know, are you, are you socially acceptable to the sort of general media, corporate, political class in London? And by the way, those people's view is very, very different from the view of my constituents in Norfolk, I can tell you. It's, in, oh. in fact, often the opposite. But that is... That is there, is a, there is a group think around that stuff. Well, coming up after the break, part two of my interview with Liz Truss about her position on many things, including trans ideology. You don't want to miss it. I'm Julia Harley-Brewer. You're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans 
sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think but, like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is... ...is to save the West. It's where she shares her thoughts on Net Zero, the Rwanda plan, Donald Trump and many other topics. Well, in part two of my interview, I questioned her about her position on trans ideology and why she led the gender ID debate. Uh, let's uh, talk about that now. One of the things that you didn't get into in terms of the group think and where you did stand firm, and, and as a woman, I'm very grateful to that, to you, is on the trans issue um, and gender self-ID um, and standing up for women's, not just identity, but safety uh, and, and privacy as well. Um, Kemi Badenoch, uh, still in government, of course, uh, has talked about how the woke capture of British institutions has meant that actually even after the CAST report last week on the Tavistock and, and uh, children uh, being transitioned, um, having their bodies mutilated, I mean, mm. absolutely horrific stuff that's been going on, um, that, that actually the trans capture is so, so strong. And people have shown cowardice. They need to show more bravery in speaking out. When you were um, one of your roles as, as uh, Women's Inequalities uh, Minister, you stopped gender self-ID. What did you know then, which your colleagues say, like, I don't know, um, Penny Mordaunt, who said on the floor of the House of Commons, trans women are women, and Gillian Keegan, now Education Secretary, who has said in, in letters, trans women are women. What did you know that they don't know? Well, I looked at the issues from first principles, and it seemed to me obvious that you can't change your sex. You don't need a PhD in biology to understand that. And it was clear then that there were... I mean, I think it was around that time the Kira Bell case was, was, was coming out. But it was clear that children were being misled, were being given puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones that would damage their future fertility, you know, their future, you know, body. And I just thought that was appalling. And what, what I remember at the time is I had lots of meetings with the LGBT lobby the likes of Stonewall. And they were sort of saying to me, well, you know, these children will be suicidal if it doesn't happen, et cetera, et cetera. They were trying to use emotional blackmail. And I, I reacted viscerally to that because the, the role of a government minister is to do the right thing, not to give in to that type of pressure. And I think with our institutions, the problem is that they because they're not directly democratically accountable, they don't feel the same relationship with the public and understand what the public's views of these things are. And it, they just become very easily influenceable. You don't go along with our ideology. If you don't do this with your lose at your school or your university or your corporate, you won't be on our list of yeah. LGBT but friendly you and I employers. would say, who cares? <laughs> yeah, you they... might, we might say, who cares? But that had become a badge of honour. Yeah. You know, and it, it, it's, again, it's part of this sort of social signalling that goes on amongst a particular group of people. And I, I'm increasingly hearing from constituents on the doorstep, people are saying, I know I shouldn't say this, but... Yeah. Or I could be arrested for expressing this view, however. And people, like, really feel this sort of sense of 
these things not being acceptable. And I think that's very powerful. And you have to be you have to be quite brave to stand up to that and say, I am prepared to be reviled. And of course, J.K. Rowling is the ultimate example of somebody who's just been prepared to tell these people to get stuffed. Yeah. But it's... And been proven to be right. Do you think the other politicians, the Keir Starmers, who think that apparently 99.9% .9 of women don't have a penis, but this other 0.1%, which is thousands, I think it's about 30,000 women apparently do, um, do you think they actually believe the stuff they no, say? No, they don't. I don't believe for a minute that Keir Starmer thinks that there are any women who have a penis. Why do they say Of course he it? doesn't. Because Why do so many on your because side Because he's that? under intense pressure from the left of the Labour Party. You can see this, and it's the same is true with the Democrats in, in the US. It, these extremists who believe in gender ideology or they believe in, you know, they're extremely, you know, they believe in supporting Hamas or whatever, they're constantly pushing to, to occupy and bring, and he is trying to compromise with those people. And my message to all of these politicians, including Starmer and indeed some conservatives, is you can't compromise with people who don't believe in biology. Yeah, you know, you can't. It's not negotiation. You no, know, it's not. You know, it's like you can't compromise with somebody who is who believes in terrorism. There isn't a halfway. You've, you've, you've led us very nicely to the issue of what's going on in the Middle East. Um, we have seen over the weekend, of course, the, uh, uh, the uh, Iranian attack on Israel, uh, more than 101 drones and missiles uh, intercepted, thankfully, largely uh, with, with, without uh, injury to people in Israel um, and expected uh, retaliation from Israel. Um, is the West up to the fight with the existential fight that we are facing with um, Islamist uh, extremists in the Middle East. Are we up to that fight, US, UK, France and others? We need to do more. We absolutely need to do more. Do we have the back? And it's not, it's not the Islamist fight is also linked to Russia, it's linked to China. You know, we know that China is circumventing the sanctions on Iran. We know that Hamas went to Russia. So this is a this is a group of countries that want to undermine Western civilization. An axis of evil? Yeah, it's an axis of evil. They want to undermine Western civilization, and we are not treating them like that. You know, in the 80s, Reagan called out the USSR as the evil empire. We don't hear that type of rhetoric from Biden. In fact, he's been trying to do a deal with Iran on you know, re re resuscitating. Uh, the JCPOA, and you know, Janet Yellen was in China recently. So no, I don't think, I don't think we're spending enough on defence right across Europe and America. And I also think we're not, we're not understanding the nature of the threat. The nature of the threat is they want to end our way of life. Most people in the West, I don't think, get that. And we see that with these, uh, you know, we're dealing with Gaza. We see people on the streets uh, every other Saturday in London, perhaps not understanding... Well, I fear some of those people want to undermine our way of life as well. It's, no, it's not a surprise that these, are, these ideologies are linked. Mm -hmm. You know, support for Hamas, support for extreme, you know, eco, eco solutions, support for the woke transgender agenda. I mean, amazingly, because they're all contradictory, but what they're all about is saying there's something, menti there's something fundamentally bad about British culture and society. There's something fundamentally bad about American and culture and society. We should be somehow ashamed of it. Mm. And by the way, there are these so-called freedom fighters over here. So th these things are very are linked, in my view. The, okay. the sort of rotting from within and the threat from without. So in order to deal with it, we need to get our own act together. Will the world be a safer place uh, after November the 5th this year with President Trump uh, in the, back in the Oval Office or President Biden remaining there? It will be safer with President Trump. Why? And I hope he gets elected. Why? Well, let's look at the evidence. Let's look at what happened when Trump was president. And I've been in cabinet for both the Trump and the Biden presidencies. And you didn't have Putin's aggression in Ukraine. You didn't have this, you know, he took a very tough line on China and he took a very tough line on Iran in terms of withdrawing from the nuclear deal and putting on 
sanctions. And I think what, what we're seeing now is the result of the fact that there has been too much appeasement of these regimes. And I believe Trump would stop that appeasement. OK. Let's bring things back home to the UK. We've also got a general election likely to be this year. There's some talk of a July election now. I know, you've rolled your eyes. Please, Alice Emerson, Please the, no. the general British public also doing so. I'm, my um, money's on November. November. And okay. I think that would be best for everyone concerned. <laughs> when you say best for everyone concerned, do the Conservatives deserve to win the next election? Yes, Why? we do. Well, I think we could do more to deserve to win it even more by being clear about what we need to do, such as leaving the ECHR, such as taking a stronger stance on things like net zero, such as passing my private member's bill to stop puberty blockers and gender, cross-gender hormones. So I think there are more things we could do. But fundamentally, what Keir Starmer would do is turbocharge all of these problems we've been talking about. You know, the overpowerful leftist bureaucrats would be empowered uh, by Keir Starmer, the might lawyers... Might have an opposition for a change. Should be quite the nice, lawyers, it? Sorry? Might have an opposition for a change if the Tories are ousted. That'd be nice. Well, he is, he is in the opposition at the moment, and he's not... I don't think he's convincing the public, and I think it would be very bad news for Britain if he got in. Now, would I like us to do more? Would I like us to take a stronger stand on these issues? Yes, I would, which is exactly what I'm advocating in, in my book. But certainly... You know, if people think that Keir Starmer is the answer, I don't know what they think the question is. They've, um, got, no, they've got no idea about why the country has had very little economic growth for the past 25 years. They've got no analysis at all. I think, it's I think the answer would be we haven't had enough immigrants. <laughs> I think that would be the answer. We need to have more. I, can I ask you, um, if you had a choice between Keir Starmer in number 10 and Nigel Farage perhaps going back to lead Reform UK, things, we see strange things happen in elections in the last few years in number 10. Who would you prefer? You, of course, at Nigel Farage's six years birthday Yeah, I wasn't party. invited. I was... Keir Starmer has never invited no, me to not... his party. I'm really so, shocked uh... to hear that. <laughs> and no doubt shocking for you as well. Um, who would you prefer well, if you had a choice clearly, between I would those like, two? I would like Nigel Farage to join the Conservative Party. I clearly think Nigel Farage has got better ideas than Keir Starmer. Would but you... the reality is the choice is between Conservatives and Labour at the election. But I've been very clear that I think Nigel Farage should join the Conservative Would you have party. had him as perhaps a, a US, you know, our ambassador to the United States? Um, I don't... I'm, I'm not sure that would be a particularly good use of his talents. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there a route back to government for you? We've seen, you know, William Hague return from Port Tory leader... Uh, to go and on to obviously to be uh, foreign secretary. I mean, Ian Duncan Smith, of course, when he was Tory leader, went on. Okay, he wasn't prime minister. David Cameron, prime minister, back. I think much to everyone's surprise, as foreign secretary. I'm, I'm actually enjoying the freedom of being able to say what I really think. Why and can't you say what you really think in government? Isn't that because part of the you're problem tied? You're tied by collective responsibility, but also you've got a 24-hour me media which is totally focused on gotcha, and anything you say can be used in evidence against you the whole time. Uh, and from where I am now, I can say what I think in a much more, a much more free way. And it, my, my frustration with British political debate is it is very superficial. There's an awful lot of focus on who's the party leader or you know, who's up and who's down. And there are some really serious things that have gone wrong in this country. And... You know, the economy isn't growing enough. We've got this huge sort of woke problem that is infecting everything from sports teams to schools. You know, we've got an immigration issue that the government is trying to be solved but is being blocked by the courts. And no, the, way the government be... isn't being blocked by the courts. We had 745,000 people given well, visas. Well, that's true. That's a di yeah. oh, they were that's legal the, visas. That's the, that's the legal... I, I agree we need to do more on that as well. But, but my point is... Very little bandwidth seems to be going into discussing how do we do those fundamental changes. And I, and my heart, I'm a Democrat. People voted for change twice, and we need to deliver it. And the political class, or whatever you want to call them, needs to wake up. Well, one that. of the things you mentioned and you talk about in your memoir, I say, Ten Years to Save the West," out today, um, is is about the the lack of support in Number Ten. 
uh, as Prime Minister, as you, as you mentioned earlier, that just like you know, getting a getting a food delivery from a supermarket and things like that. But in, is there? You talk about it being. You felt like a prisoner. You felt claustrophobic. You were cut off. You were isolated. Also, you had a security issue with your phone, so people like me didn't have your phone number anymore. Um, um, you Maybe know, that was a good thing. That was anyway. <laughs> it's a good thing to be fair. Um, but you know, and there were leaks and things going on. Do you feel that that part of the problem we've got in in government right now is not just the blob and the civil service and all of that, but actually that we, we have a presidential style system unofficially, especially just the prime minister among equals, but a presidential system, but we don't have anything like the support for the man or woman in that top job. Yes, completely. I think there are, there's, there's two things. One is the government is not structured like that. So the media assume that mm -hmm. and it takes up a huge amount of bandwidth for filling that role but it's not structured like that. It's still structured mm. as it was before. The second problem is the kind of political and personal support for the prime minister, in my view, is not, you know, is not big enough or good enough. Mm. And you know, I, I went in, admittedly, I was in a very difficult position because I hadn't, you know, if you come in from opposition, you've got time to build up a team, et cetera, et cetera. But I still don't think parties are necessarily good at building up the level of that political infrastructure that's required to pursue the kinds of policies. I think the permanent civil service have too much power mm -hmm. relative to elected parents. And then there's just the sheer personal stuff, like, you know, things like getting your hair and makeup done, which sound trivial, but you're... But everyone will comment on it if it's not right. You're constantly being judged on that stuff. Yeah. And, and I think that... It hasn't really caught up with the with the world as it is the 24 now. The 24-7 media world in particular. No. Just finally, um, uh, we talked a little bit earlier about, you know, you know wish you, you know, perhaps regret actually becoming prime minister and having that legacy. I don't but, regret no, that. You said you, I no, you didn't. I, I asked you about <laughs> that. But um, you, you obviously talked in your memoir also about the Queen, of course, Her Majesty dying on your second full day as prime minister, um, saying, you know, why me, why now? Um, you also talk about how she gave you advice and said to you to pace yourself um if there's one thing that you could have done differently or done in a different way what's that one thing while you were in those office in that office i don't i don't think there's anything i could have done that would have changed the outcome i mean there were lots of small things that i could have done differently you already said you stood um, by the budget yeah the the contents of it yes um obviously if i'd known that it was a massive tinderbox waiting for us in terms of this liability-driven investments issue, I would have, you know, we should have put pressure on the Bank of England governor to sort that out first. So I suppose that's yeah. the biggest thing I didn't know about that if I'd known about, I would have done something differently. Um, but, but no regrets. Je ne regret rien. Well, I don't really. And you, 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 like, I have huge benefits of hindsight. Of course I do. But... What, what I would say, I've, I've learned a lot. <laughs> I know that's how, but I've learned a hell of a lot about the power of the system, how it works, why, you know, because I always question before, you know, why aren't these prime ministers getting on and doing stuff? Now it's you so know. frustrating, and now I know. And what I want to do is use that knowledge to help other conservatives and people who want to achieve change. Okay. Uh, so. Well, we shall see how that works out. Um, Liz Truss, it's been an absolute pleasure Great to uh, see getting you. so much time to talk to you. Ten years to save the West. Uh, this is uh, the memoir of our former Prime Minister, Liz Truss. Thank you very much Thank for joining you. us here on Thanks, Talk Julie. TV. Well, that was me talking to Liz Truss a, a bit earlier. Um, Tom Slater is still with us, just briefly. Just to, I mean, she, she, she's covering a wide range of subjects there. Absolutely. And so much to, that you could pick apart there. I think the thing that you, I kind of come at this with is the sense that um, she had a lot of the right diagnosis, or at least recognising where the problems yeah. were. What policy. was wrong? What needed to be done? Exactly. We're talking about gender, you're talking about climate, you're talking about all these different issues. Some of these policies we've been pursuing were nuts. Small matter of growth, not Abs happening. Yep. Absolutely. The orthodoxy was wrong on so many of these things, but she was quite clearly had 
a lot of the wrong solutions and also it was the wrong figure to try and push those yeah, things through. Absolutely. And that yeah. became clear quite absolutely. quickly in a premiership. Tom Sater, thank you very much. Right, we've just got the last few minutes of the show. I want to move on to trans battles. Yeah, we've brought those up with Liz Truss, but they continue. Cultural Secretary Lucy Fraser has told sports chiefs in the UK that trans women athletes should be banned from competing against women because, <laughs> guess what? They're men and they have an indisputable advantage physically. Well, joining me right now is journalist Debbie Hayton, herself uh, uh, living as a trans woman. Uh, good uh, afternoon to you, Debbie. Hey, good afternoon, Julia. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, I, I mean, it's nice to hear the culture secretary speaking out. I mean, again, we could have had something on this a bit sooner, couldn't we? I mean, everyone's jumping on the post-cash report uh, bandwagon, aren't they, thinking it's safe now? But, I mean, men haven't suddenly got a physical advantage over women in sport. They've had it all along. It's almost like that was the reason why we had women's sport, isn't it? Well, it is. Everybody's always known this. And the, the thing what the cast report's done is it's allow everybody to think what they really thought rather than being cowed into submission by uh, an activist lobby, which is what, what has been going on. And too many politicians have uh, contracted out their thinking to activists. It's a disgrace, is that? Um, I mean, this is the thing. It's the fact that the activists have been able to have such impact. And we've seen, you know, in America, Leah Thomas as a swimmer. I mean, huge, big, hulking six foot pluser wandering around, apparently, with his bits wobbling in the in the breeze in, in the ladies changing room. And we had no business being, by the way, uh, are not with the consent of the other women swimmers. We see this all the time. We see runners, we see cricketers, we see footballers. We've seen even in a, a, some much harder contact sports where men are quite clearly competing claiming to be trans women, then, well, even if they are, I mean, you know, you, I was introduced you as her, but just, you know, again, I hear the word Debbie, I say her. You, you, you know, you know you're a man, you live as, a, as if you were a woman, but you know you're a man. Um, but you also know that you've got all the physical uh, ability of being a man in terms of, you know, being bigger on average, being stronger, stronger muscle mass, testosterone, all of that. You can have as much surgery and take as many, you know, um, hormones as you want. It's still got, not going to take away that advantage that men have. Well, it isn't, is it not? This is the truth. And I used to say to people, if myself and my wife are moving furniture around the house, I'll, I'll pick up the heavy end because I'm bigger, I'm stronger, and I'm able to carry those weights. Uh, for trans women to be able to get a free pass into yeah. uh, women's sports because they felt like they felt like women, whatever that meant, was, was a disgrace. It really was. But it brought this issue to the wider public uh, yeah. recognition. Uh, it stopped it from being a a rather niche issue that it had been when trans women were competing in the Olympics and everybody knew that was wrong. So that's, Absolutely. I think, brought the uh, uh, brought this out into yeah. a wider to, to wider knowledge, which was really important. Absolutely. But the key, and, and Liz Truss was saying this, the key is children. That's the biggest. That's yeah. the biggest well, again, outrage. Well, that's, that's there has on. been a move about trying to sort of you know deal with it when it comes to when it comes to sport with you know with with athletes at the top level. Of course, every time they say, "Oh, it's only it's only one person and they haven't won. What's the big deal? Why all the hate?" But actually, of course, you know, every time someone wins a medal, they're pushing other women down. They're not not getting their gold medal or the silver medal or on the podium at all. Um, and also all the women who don't get onto the team, don't get that chance, don't get that opportunity, the extra training, the extra funding. Sharon Davies, uh, of course, the Olympic swimmer herself, has been a fantastic uh, campaigner on this. But it goes all the way down to kids' sports as well. We, I, mean, I always thought, I, I mean, one of the things I've talked about on the show a lot ever since we launched in 2016 was about this issue because I knew as soon as you, you know what, as soon as you get dads involved, as soon as dads know that their daughters aren't going to win a race anymore because some boy is now competing in the girls' race, funnily enough, dads won't take any nonsense. Mums want to be nice. It's a women's affliction. But dads ain't going to be nice when it comes to their daughters basically facing, let's face it, cheats. Well, yes, and we talk about the elite level, but you're right, it goes all the way down. Uh, if I do a park run on a Saturday morning, I've got to, I put an M in the box and I, uh, I'm, I'm in that category, I'm in that male category. It doesn't bother me, I run the same race against everybody else. But what it means is I don't push other women further down their sex category. That's the outrage that happens at every single level. It's yeah. not just about winning, it is also about the taking part. Yeah. But it's also about fairness. The key thing about sport is we have the rules and we know why the rules are there and we know why we we actually brought in women's sport. And just at the point, by the way, in the last five years or so, when women's sport has started to be taken seriously, you know, women's, you know, loads of people watching the Women's World Cup in football and, and, and people, you know, women finally earning some decent dosh in sport as well. And then at this point, oh, what a funny time for a load of men to suddenly think that they're women to get involved. I mean, we, we know what's been going on. Debbie Hayton, you've been fantastic on this. Thank you very much indeed for joining us.
Um, sadly, we, we have come to the uh, end of the show. Uh, Tom Slater, just final word for you on this. Just another reminder that what we were told was trans rights turns out to be the rights of men to cheat in women's sports, to yeah. access women's space. I think it's just surely now that we've got the cash report, that we've got a much broader debate about this, yeah. we can accept that Beginning this was Beginning of the not, end on this? I hope so, but that's not to say that Absolutely. there's not a lot more work to be done. Absolutely. Thomas said it's been fantastic having you here with us it's from Spiked Online. Thank you very much as well for tuning in. Please do join me same time tomorrow. Up next, it's Kevin and Alex. Have a great afternoon. I'm Julia Hartley-Brewer. You're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <missing. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth.